Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texas Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texas Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as clear a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50-50 ball, I got to come down with You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. All right, it's February. That means it's time to go comes to AM basketball welcome into tech Ags radio presented by david gardner's jewelers rollo insurance studio it is the go hour presented by the warehouse at cc creations we call this coffee talk presented by tech Ags coffee beat the hell out of the morning by going to texags.com slash coffee ob we've talked about it every time like look and there's still a long way to go right i'm not gonna get overexcited or overcritical when things go bad although it was i was definitely a little bit uh Critical of the shot selection at times. But it's February. This team seems to turn it on the last couple of years in February. Mid-February in 21, last year, all of February, like it felt like. So there's something about the marination process, if you will, of the Buzz Williams program that when it starts to really matter and then postseason play, they've been phenomenal in the SEC tournament and NIT tournament. And uh, unfortunately, last year, the NCAA tournament, not so good in that first game, the only game. But February comes, and they start to figure things out. And when Boots is not just good, when he's great, they win. What are they, 10-1 and one when yeah. he scores 20-plus? Yeah, and he was exceptional um, the other night and that went over Florida from making the first basket for Texas A&M to the last. Yep. Um, big shots. Wade Taylor didn't have to carry the team. They played some really good defense down the stretch. I think they what they hold Florida to I think it's twenty six points in the second half. Yeah. Um, played good defense there in the like I said in the in the last minutes when they need, when they really had to. They made the clutch plays that they hadn't made in some other games. Yeah. Man, it was a great environment. Um. I think one of the things they might have, you know, well, here's what Buzz does. I think, I think, you know, I'm not a bas- basketball expert, but it seems like he's, like you said, starts figuring things out and realizes, okay, now I've got a, I've got this guy who can do this, so I'm going to ask him to do just this. And this guy, you know, and he starts moving th- pieces around. And for instance, I th- solo. I mean, goodness gracious. Uh, well, see, here's what I think. I think you know they've been having a hard time replacing Dexter Dennis. And I think what they're going to, they're going to replace him with Solo. They figured out with two guys. Solo is going to be, Solomon Washington is going to be the Dexter on, Dennis on the on ball the defender. Yeah. On defense. Jace Carter is going to be the, the guy on offense to try to fill that role. And so they broke sense. it into two. I, th- I think so. It feels know? that way. I, I think so. Kind of a Solomon like wisdom going to split it in two. I don't, you know, I'm sure you know that story. So, um, but that's just one thing. And, and, you know, they, they, Florida is really long, really huge. Their coach, what's his name? Oh, Golden. What a, he, what a he, whiny ass. What a whiny. You know, he, I heard at the, at the end of the game, he's whining about not getting as many foul calls. Look at how many three pointers you took versus AM attacking the rim. When you're shooting, more than half of your shots, I think, were three pointers. So when you're shooting three pointers, you're not going to get as many fouls yep. as a team that's attacking the basket. That's just that's ba- common that's, sense. Oh, it, but let, let's go back to that for a second, um, and not about the whiny coach, but about attacking the rim. That was the thing. Remember, there was a part in the game where Boots was attacking, but they weren't falling. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't care. This is exactly what I want from him. When he goes downhill. Not only does he know how to switch and get to his left and like um, 
take the pressure and gets hit and body and get, the best offensive rebounding team of the country can get a lot of those boards. Keep doing that, and that's exactly what he did. He took and then when Wade was in foul trouble, Boots just put the team on his back. And yeah. this is after you know the reports out about Friday. Was it Friday? It was uh, Friday. Yeah. Came out Friday, which, by the way, that's another thing. I heard F- Florida fans are complaining about that, and like you guys supported Air- Aaron Hernandez and a whole wet crime wave under Urban Meyer, and it was okay. This guy, that, a, a month ago, this guy boots allegedly uh, evaded arrest allegedly because look, I've said this before. I said it with Ryan McCollum. I'm typically 99% with the cops. However, if you're in a position where a bike cop may, I think it's very, and this was the situation with Ryan McCollum, and I don't know if they're the same or different. You know, I'm not there, but I'm just saying that it, it, let's just say it's harder to, if a bike cop is trying to flag you down, I think it's harder to see it yep. than if it's a, uh, you know, a, a, a patrol car. All right. Now, I don't know if there was an issue or not, but in the past that has been, and, and Ron McCollum, you know, won that argument. So I, I wonder if, uh, but, but beyond that, uh, Boots came back, oh, came back. You know what? Boots did come back. He come back, he came back to being his old self after a he week He came back off. in multiple ways. Uh, by the way, if you got a speeding ticket that you forgot to pay. I'm going to use that kind of level of, of, and they arrested you on a Thursday. Hey, you didn't pay it and you pay your fine. You'd still be expected to come to Texas on Friday morning. That's how it works. Like, and and then also you look, we don't know what's going on with like marble, but there's obviously something serious. So when you're dealing with something serious, the guy's not playing. No. We're talking about something that I don't, that, that from what the reports that are coming out, are but let's just keep it to the Maybe basketball not. game all right so he's out well, that's part of and it. he comes back yeah and with all these distractions potentially that guy just put his head down and went to work man he went to work he and paid. he was great in the paint he was great with his timing and and you know what they're in the especially in the first half that, that was a physical game the the officials were letting them play play physical basketball yeah. and there were a lot of times when you saw boots or somebody else going inside, and again, Florida is so much bigger, and there would be contact and no call. And then the Florida coach is getting all bent out of shape that there were some, you know, that he didn't get some calls. Well, they they called it, they were letting him play physical the whole game. Right. And it's just, I look, well, I just think he's, uh, are, are these guys that were born at a certain time now after the or the. Would, would he be considered a millennial or um, yeah. is Boots a millennial? I, I think he's know. the one after the millennial. Well, I don't what, know. Whatever he is, I think, Dawson, look it up. Let, let, I think let he's, us know. What, what generation are you? I think baby I, boomers. I think so. I was born in '61. Okay, so I think he's just a part of a soft generation that. Jump at the coach. Yeah, that that wants to hold his breath and stomp when he didn't get things go his way. I think I'm Gen X. Yeah, and what came after? Is it Gen Z know. after that? I don't know. I, I don't know. Why should be? Should be Gen Y if it, after Gen X. I believe he's a millennial. He's a millennial. What's his name again? I should know this. Golden. Golden. Gold. Anyway, I just it, it didn't strike. It didn't sit well with me. I saw th- they sh- showed a replay of a Florida guy with the basketball after a rebound, and he swings his elbows back. The one on Jace and his he chest. He hits Jace Carter dead in the chest. They call a foul on Jace Carter. I guess his chest fouled the elbow. Uh, they explained it on the television. Well, I didn't, yeah, I didn't see the it. The rule behind that is you're supposed to give him the space. Yeah. I didn't. It didn't look like he was crowding me, but fine. All right. This, but but how, okay, then it, at the worst, n- incidental contact, Jace didn't foul him. But all right, he hits him in the chest with his elbow. And Florida not only doesn't get a foul, but a And M gets a foul for it. Right. And this same coach is begging and compl- and, and and complaining that well we we didn't get some calls. I'm like well, come on, you know what? what another get sto- your pacifier in your mouth and go sit in the corner. I'm glad a storyline isn't going to be developed, and that being Wade losing the game. Um, yeah, yeah, because that would have yeah because 
thank goodness for boots. Thank goodness for defense that that play, which, by the way, shouldn't have happened. Boneheaded mistake. But all right. You know, apparently the official's telling him, you can't move. Yeah, you can't. Um, but, but the official told him right before, right. and he ended up moving, unfortunately. That all being said, it's not a storyline. You know, a mistake happened, the defense came through, and they ended up winning the game. They did. Um, I think Solomon Washington was on a guy and forced him to harass him into losing control of the ball, and now they've, they're out of their offense and, and they're, they're rushing and panicking a little bit, and the guy gets up a shot and he misses it, and it comes out and uh, – then it was first. It was uh, Clayton that missed the shot, and then it comes out. To, I think to Pullen, who had had such a big game, and Jace Carter's come over to block him, so he has to pull his shot down uh, for Carter to come to kind of fly past him, and then he gets ready to shoot his shot. And Carter's coming back behind him, still has his arm in to affect the shot come behind him, and yep. you know, and he was short. And uh, then I think Solomon Washington, you know, gets the rebound on the scrum, and everybody and. 11,000 plus at Reed. What a great uh, environment. They all go crazy with the win. It was a, it was a beautiful afternoon at Reed. The Reed. two biggest wins of the year, you would say, and, and then looking back, Iowa State man yeah, being in there, yes. but um, Kentucky. Kentucky and uh, this, this Florida game is up there, right? Oh, I think this was huge. Um, first of all, Florida's pretty good and they're going to win a lot of games. But um, just to, Give, feel like you may be changing the trajectory of this uh, of this season. Now they got to do it a couple more times, right? Yeah, the, you, and they got games coming up. Tennessee twice. Yeah, but the, they got games coming up. I'm going to say like four of the three of the next four games you'd expect them to win. Uh, Missouri, Tennessee, at Vandy, at Alabama. Uh, okay, and, and then maybe who's after Alabama? Arkansas. Arkansas. Okay, three of the next five you should be expected to win. All right, so this is an opportunity to, uh, you know, if you can pull off an up, what's going to be considered an upset or two, then, you know, you may be find yourself right back in the championship race. Momentum will go a long way for this team, but proud of the grit. Look, and not, we, we not championship race, but definitely in the NCAA picture. We come to expect that for these teams to play that way, um, but proud of the grit, right? Like, because that game could have gotten out of hand a couple different times. <laughs> You know, yeah. couple, a couple double-digit deficits, and you're thinking yeah. to yourself, oh, here we go again. Yeah. Down 13 in the first half, down 12 in the second half. And it chipped away, just, chipped away, chipped away. And they did what, you know, they're supposed to do. They seized control, and they made the game-winning plays on both ends of the floor. And by the way, they still weren't good at the free-throw line. Uh, no. That, that, um, but, they, they, but their defense came to play. And I think their defense the last couple of games has gotten significantly better. Forcing 13 turnovers. Yeah, I thought they played, especially in the second half. You know, uh, you know. The, again, they gave up 26 points, I think, in the second half. And six of them, I got my notes here. Uh, yeah, they, six of them came in the first 100 seconds of the second half. They hit a, two threes to, to start the second half, and they get up 46-34. Uh, uh, they scored 20 points the rest of the half. Well, and again, another game. It comes down to a possession or two. Yeah. This is that's life in the SEC, but it's certainly life for AM this year. Every game I feel like it is down to the last possession. And that's why you gotta win those games at home. You have to. Yeah. Because you know, you're, well, you're, you're playing with the twelfth man, you're playing with uh, house not house money, you're playing with the uh, the momentum, the vibe, uh, your environment, and you dictated the tempo in the game against Florida. That's why you win. Well, we don't expect boots to have that game. Every time out, but if he, if that is the uh, level of confidence that, that he played with, though, well, if that's the signal that he's back and he's going to be playing to the level that we've expected over the last couple of years, then I think you'll see A and M win a whole lot more games. One hundred percent. All right. If you want to be part of the conversation this morning, you can do it multiple ways. You can call us up nine seven nine six nine three eleven fifty. We'll pick it up on the Brian Foley Law Hotline, or you can text us at that same number nine seven nine six nine three. 1150. Are you buying Aggie basketball? Are you back in? You think this team's about to make a nice little run there in the SEC? Let's uh, go around the room and say hello to the people. We go behind the glass and say hi to our director, Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy, good morning, y'all. Oh, hey. oh, thank you. Yeah, a little quick switch there. Sorry about glitch. that. Uh, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I didn't get to watch a single second of that ball game. I was uh, doing some things in the church with my fiance, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we... we wrapped up everything with mass, but I, I had my phone out in service, kind of like looking, because there's like 20 seconds left, 
oh my gosh, they take the lead. Oh my gosh, Florida gets two shots, and then bam, final. So obviously I missed probably one of the best games that they'll play this season, unfortunately, but uh, happy to see you win. And like you said there, David, if if this is the sign that, that Boots is going to start producing like we had hoped, uh, yeah, and what you said too, OB, then... Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I, it's a, it's a good sign for things to come for sure. Look, Boots just Boots needs to be better than he has been, and I'm not saying better than what he was on Saturday night or Saturday afternoon. But he needs to be better. He doesn't have to do that for this team to win, right? Because I think Wade didn't have a signature Wade game. Well, he was in foul trouble, right? As, Wade, as was Anderson Garcia. And Wade doesn't need to score 29 points or 30 points either, right? You get really good Wade and really good Boots. With Solo and Andy doing their thing and uh, Jace Carter maybe doing the Dexter Dennis offensive role like you talked about, you're going to win games. And you're going to win games late. Yeah. I, I, you know, this team just plays with so much tenacity. And sometimes they got to overcome themselves. And they did that. But, they, man, they just – they will fight you. They, they will, will fight, fight you. you. All right, let's uh, go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant. Matthew Dawson is there. Matthew, good morning, buddy. Good morning. There's there was a lot going on this weekend in terms of AM athletics. Track and field had a meet. They yeah. won 12 individual events at the Charlie Thomas Invitational. So that was very, very awesome. Women's golf is actually playing right now, I believe. Uh, as of yesterday, they were second and only behind by one stroke overall at the Puerto Rico Classic there. And I want to go with them to that. Yeah. I want to be the uh, golf SID. Well, we have, uh, I think that's Brandon Collins, by the way. We have Garrett uh, Chadwell coming in with, uh, I believe Amy's coming with him on Thursday. So, No, excuse me, Jim, Jenny's coming on Thursday. So they're both coming in. Excellent. Jenny. The men's basketball team won, of course, as we know. The women's basketball team unfortunately lost. But they lost to, you know what, a really good Mississippi State team. That Mississippi State team is 19-5. They just beat LSU the other day. They've won four straight. So I'm not super worried about Aggie women's basketball right now, and that's what's going on with the Aggies. All right, thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that. When we come back here on Tech Ags Radio, we're going to uh, revisit the three things we wanted to see this weekend, see how close we got. Uh, Mr. Dawson's got a look at the Senior Bowl and the East-West Shrine game, kind of give us a recap of what happened over the weekend. And then on Friday afternoon, OB, I'm sure you saw this, uh, the Big Ten and the SEC are, are trying to come up with a new compensation model and maybe a new playoff system for the rest of college football. We can discuss that. I'm assuming, tell me if you, you agree with me here, they, apparently Sankey and um, what's, what's the homeboy's name at uh, Big Ten? I forgot I've his name. already forgotten. The I new guy. it was Warren, and, and he yeah. left to mess Petiti up the or something like that? Well, I don't, I don't yeah. know. Petiti? I was right. All right, Tony Petiti. They had a meeting, secret meeting. Poss- I look, it's not a rumor. I'm just assuming if they went to go have a meeting and eat food during yeah. it, they, they might have come to call station and to Brian. Uh, yeah, I think that would have been a great idea. And what day was the meeting? Let's just pretend it's every day of the week. Let's well, just pretend they started they, on a Tuesday. Well, then they could have gotten the rib dips. You know what? That's a way to start off your week. And if you feel good in your belly. Yeah, if you feel good, then you're going to. Ideas start flowing. Then, yeah, they start flowing. Then, then over a, uh, maybe the next day, you had some chopped beef on a. Baked potato? On a baked potato. And then you start thinking, well, okay, we got some ideas. Let's now, come let's back start, and yeah, let's, let's start. Yeah. Let's Thursday. Start, uh, Thursday, you got a pork chop. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You and got then you're the like, macaroni look, and cheese. We're really close to announcing this, but before we announce this, let's have one more lunch at Fargo's yeah. on a Friday. And yeah. Then, and get the, say, is that the four C's. You get the catfish. catfish, the coleslaw, the corn, the crunchy hush puppies. And by then, you say, you know what? Let's announce it. I've had such a great week. Let's just announce this. And, uh, and then and Saturday, you celebrate, right? With more rib tips oh. as, you, as you leave college football spinning on an, on its head. Yeah, I think that's exactly what happened. Rumor has it that that story's fake, but we can't confirm or deny it, right? We should ask Blender and Alan. Yeah. Hey, they, did you see Petiti they, and Sankey? They'd probably say, I, I cannot confirm or deny, but I can give you some rib tips on a Tuesday. Mm. And, you know, those big and that's even better than confirmation or denial. I can confirm that those rib tips are amazing. 1701 South Texas Avenue in Bryan, without a doubt. The, what? the best barbecue in Texas, i.e. the world. To Savas, that's their trademark. Well, it's factual. It's true. See? See. It's Fargo's.
The Mountain is High, Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio Go Hour, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. Maroon never looks so good with Maroon U. I am David Nuno. He is Olin Buchanan. And today is Monday, February the 5th, 2024. Yeah. Already February. in February, buddy. I think we were in February or Friday, but I just... Almost a quarter of the way through it. Can we go over the three things that we wanted to see? If you, 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 yours are usually pretty copy and paste. Like, yeah. you, you have a formula that wins Aggie basketball Remember games. I, I said I didn't want Wade Taylor to have to score 30. You got that? Want, yeah, and I wanted... Uh, you, know, you said mention boots. I wanted other guys to step up and help yeah. them out, and we got that with boots. And then I can't remember if I said something about defense, maybe, you know. Yep. Uh, sounds like something I probably said. And again, the second half, I thought they played extraordinary defense. All right, here are the three things I had for Friday when I wanted to see this weekend. Up-tempo basketball. I think we got a little bit of that. Yeah. We got downhill basketball. I don't know if up-tempo is the right way to phrase it, but they went downhill. I'm going to take. A, I'm gonna say that's a, a W for me. Okay. Dominate what you do best. Not just good, dominate. I think they were pretty dominant defensively. I thought they were, I don't know if dominant is the right word, but I think they were really, really good defensively. Again, especially in the second half. Yep. When it mattered most. When it mattered most. The third one I got wrong. A&M women to beat Mississippi State at home. Can't have them all, Obi. Yeah. yeah. Like Dawson over there said, uh, Mississippi State's on a roll right now. They are on a roll. They're very good. All right, let's go back to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Matthew Dawson has got an update for us from the Senior Bowl and the East-West Shrine game, which actually happened on Thursday. There weren't any real stats to come out of that one. Matthew, so I guess that'll be a quick one, but uh, let's kind of get through uh, some of the notes that you saw. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about the East-West Shrine Bowl. I'll talk about like it in general. If you don't get to watch those games, I highly recommend that you watch those games, and I also recommend if you're like an NFL draft guy, you can actually look at stats on it's zebrastats.com or zebra.com, and they actually tell you like practice stats, like top speed, max acceleration, max deceleration, and like total distance traveled. So you can kind of like get a picture of like how hard these guys are. explosive plays was like another one. So those are really cool metrics to look at. You can kind of see how hard guys are practicing individually. But for the East West Shrine Bowl, the West just kicked the, the East's teeth in, right? right? W- which is nice because Demonte Richardson, our, our, our Aggie, the only Aggie in that bowl game, was, was on the West. Was on the West. And you know what? We didn't see him a ton, but you know it's hard to watch on TV and like watch see for like secondary guys. And it's probably a good thing that we didn't see a lot of them, right? Given that he's in the secondary. But highlights: Frank Gore Jr. balled out. He had like 90 yards in the first four carries and a touchdown. And yes, that Frank Gore, his kid, plays at Southern Miss. He will likely be in the NFL. Maybe not drafted super high, but he'll be good. I probably. remember watching Frank Gore in college, man. Miami. That was yeah. a loaded running back. Was that Willis McGee? Was that yeah. Frank Gore and? They should have won that championship. And was Clinton Portis in there? He might have been in there. He, he might have been actually. They should have won. Was it the Ohio State game? That yeah, they should. Oh yeah, they there. got well. They got hosed. Uh, what do you know? It was a Big Twelve official. Uh, mm. Terry Porter. That one. That one hurt. Kansas guy. Two guys got Kansas inducted State. to the East West Shrine Bowl Hall of Fame. So that was Steve Sark- Sarkeesian. So they had like a ten minute interview with Steve Sarkeesian. So that was kind of annoying. I was trying to watch. Yeah, I don't think I need that info. I'm good. Yeah, that was. I was, I was annoyed. To say the least. And then let's get to the Senior Bowl then. Senior Bowl, we had three Aggies in there. Anaya Smith. Pretty limited snaps. All of his snaps on offense came in the slot, which was, I mean, probably what he's going to play in the NFL. Be, yeah. Where he should be. Uh, he had a punt return. That looked pretty decent for a few yards. Uh, in practice, he was top seven in deceleration, the deceleration metric of all the wide receivers in the Senior Bowl. So he's making quick cuts, which is really awesome. McKinley Jackson. I thought he had some really good reps in that game, and we heard some stuff that he was doing well in practice. I mean, he mauled the double team on one play, made a huge stop. He was double team all game long from what I was reading. Yeah, he was, I mean, he was wrecking stuff, and he, he was just explosive. He was using that strength, and he was just stronger than these guys, which is awesome to see. And he didn't grade so well like, in terms of speed metrics, but he's also being graded. They, they grade D-line altogether, right? So he's ranked really low because they're comparing a giant McKinley Lions. Jackson to – you know, like edge rushers like that are, you know, 250 pounds. If so. you guys listened to John Harris on Friday, he would say that, you know, that as good as McKinley has looked, he's only using his, like, his ability to use power and maul through people. He needs to add a couple of moves. And he said he may have those moves. He just hadn't been showing them at practice. But once he adds some moves, um, swim move, whatever it may be, he'll be able to, uh, he thinks he'll take his game to another level. Well, yeah, there's a, Particular defensive tackle in the NFL that's second team all pro that, you know, added some book moves to his arsenal and, you know, really made some improvements. Worked out well. Worked out well. And then last one, Layden Robinson. Did he did some here. really good reps in pass pro, I thought. Like really good reps. And in practice, he had the third highest acceleration metric of any offensive lineman. So 
probably like what teams are going to be looking at. Maybe like if they run like a zone or gap scheme, right? Or sorry, power gap scheme, like get that guard pulling, get him moving uh, if he's getting off that pull really quickly. So uh, overall, it's pretty nice seeing our Aggies out there. Unfortunately, the American team lost and all of our Aggies were on the American team, but it was still an enjoyable watch. Yeah. OB, I know the answer to this. I know it. Did you watch the Pro Bowl? I did not. Did you know the Pro Bowl was yesterday? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, it's always the Sunday before the Super Bowl, so I knew that. It's, it's flag, right? Or some touch I don't even know, because I don't even know why they have it. Even when they played the game, I think the last time I remember watching I saw the, the Pro Bowl was when Matt Schaub won the MVP one year. It was the year before <laughs> his pick six. That was the last time I remember like what, like sitting down and what. And even when it was... I'm talking 15, 20 years. I didn't really watch the Pro Bowl. Yeah. I just kind of kept up with it. It was actually pretty cool when I was a kid uh, because, you know, players didn't get paid. Like, not everybody was millionaires, right? So if you're in the Pro Bowl and if you're NFC one or, the, you know, they got more, more like $5,000 compared to two fifty or 10000 compared to 5000 <laughs> And I can remember, you know, like I said, I was a kid. So Mel Renfro, the Cowboys, returned a punt for a touchdown and – might have scored another touchdown, and the so it was a big deal because your guy was the MVP, and 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 they won, and there was a real rivalry, if you will, between the NFC and yep. AFC. But again, the biggest part was the guys needed the money, and so they really played a football game. Well, I, I assume. Tell me if I'm right here. The reason you really didn't watch the Pro Bowl is because you were all getting ready for your pre-party for the Grammys because I know you were all in on the Grammys. Yeah, I would have watched the uh, Pro Bowl about 10 times before I'd watch the Grammy. My daughters have it on, and the only part that I, I paid attention to two parts. One part was uh, Luke Combs and Tracy Chapman performing together. Okay. I mean, it was all right. It was whatever. Are you singing the same song? Fast Cars. Yeah. Yeah. She, the original, he yeah. did the remake. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good. And then Jay-Z. I uh, went on stage, and I know you're a big Jay-Z fan, so I saw that. He didn't perform. He got an award, like like a Lifetime Achievement kind of award. Hmm. I know. Oh, you're probably a U2 guy. They performed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're fine. Yeah. Bono, you're not a big Bono guy? No, I, I mean, he's fine. I'm not a detractor of Bono and U2. The uh, Edge. Billy Joel? I, know, I like Billy Joel, okay. I like the early Billy Joel. You know who was there? Joni Mitchell. Hmm. Good. Yeah, she. Perf- I think she performed. I just heard her name in the commercial. Yeah. So. She's, yeah. I. Um. Yeah. I. Uh, I think. I think the Grammys have jumped the shark, as as they say. Yeah. No interest at all. None. None. I think they're polluting the minds of America. I don't know how to <laughs> respond to that. Maybe Chance McClain can do a heritage film on Joni Mitchell. <laughs> what about that? No, well, she'd probably she's, she's probably already had some. She's probably yeah. She got behind the music. She's got her own thing. But Joni Mitchell's producer, I'm gonna make up a fake name, Claude. Claude. Yeah, Claude Van Du. He, that's probably not a good one. No. Claude, but why not? Well, Cla- Claude Van Du. All right, he helped find. All right, I mean, I'm not gonna go that bit. That's that's not working out the way I wanted it to. Bottom line is, you want a, a documentary about your family, you should do it. You should absolutely do it. And if you're asking yourself, why would I get a documentary done about my family? Well, it's to honor people in your family, right? You want to honor your dad and tell his life story. You want to honor your mom. You want to honor the family business, the family ranch. You want to just talk about how your mom and dad met and tell that whole story and how they've been married for 50 plus years. You want to tell family stories. Chance McClain can do that. It's not just for VH1 behind the music. You can have a documentary done about normal people, everyday people, because we all have an important story. And that's what Chance McClain does with Heritage Films. He's got that. He's got the Heritage Film. He's also got the Year Flicks, which are 20-minute versions. Not really a documentary. They're more Q&A for the kids, right? And when I say kids, it can be 12 years old. It can be 18. It can be in college, right? To us, they're kids. Freshman year of college, tell the story. You know, the 20 most important things about their time uh, in life at that moment. They're into this, they're into that. This is going to be their major. Sophomore year, they change their major. You tell that story. Junior year, they get their Aggie ring. You tell that story. Senior year, they graduate. They get engaged. And you have yourself a four-part series called The Year Flicks. The phone number for Heritage Films, 713-893-8341. 713-893-8341. The website, yourheritagefilm.com, is Heritage Films.
Tech Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers in the Rollo Insurance Studio. They are the official insurance provider of Tech Radio. The difference is real. They can write any form of insurance, and they're built around educating you on exactly what you're paying for, doing the shopping for you so that you can accomplish all of your insurance goals. they got 45 offices here in Texas, headquarters on Highway 6 right here in College Station. Call them up, 888-44-ROLLO, or go to rolloinsurance.com. It is the GAR, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. OB, this is not a surprise. I think sometimes the timing of the news coming out is what surprises me. But I expected for this day to happen soon. The Big Ten and SEC saying, we're linking up our, our brains and we're going to fix this college football thing because we cannot rely on the government. We cannot rely on the NCAA. A bunch of imbeciles are running things. We need to figure it out because we've got our conferences and college football's um, future in our hands. We can take care of business. Uh, yeah, you know what? It's funny. Um, I don't mean to pet pot. Ugh. Pat myself on the back. I'll, but, pat, uh, you. I'll pat you. But uh, my old coworker up in uh, up in uh, Tennessee, who now works for Vanderbilt, Martin Simmons. We used to have this conversation. This back in twenty years ago, it seems like. And I would say, hey, it, the day's going to come when the the big conferences are going to break off. Mm-hmm. And uh, but because it was always a, a kind of a messed up model that you know. Alabama, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, LSU had the same vote as UH, Rice, and there was more of the have-nots, right, than there was the haves. And you just knew at some point the the haves would say, look, why are we having policy dictated by, by people that can't play at the same tables that we can play. And then you always had this, this organization that was, that really didn't do anything. Yep. And when they did, they were often, uh, you know, uh, punishing violations, but depending on who you were, your Penalty. You could two schools could have the same penalty, and one school would get a more severe penalty than the other. You know, the so why? It's almost like the NCAA is also the middleman because you're having to pay them. So if you've got a if you've owned your own product, why, why even why not break away and say, hey, look, we're going to set up a uh, an organization that's just going to be, be the guys that can play at our tables. I would like to see, excuse me for using a, a soccer reference here, OB, but a promotion relegation kind of atmosphere in college football, but where the founding fathers, if you will, stay, right? But then there's a, if you are a program that builds yourself up to being able to compete with the big dogs, I think you should have that opportunity. Um, I would say you have to average 40,000 fans a game. You have to. <laughs> the U of H is out. Yep. And, and maybe more than that, but I'd say for, Vanderbilt may be out. Yeah. But that may be, who knows, maybe they saw that coming, and that's why they're putting more uh, into it, into their program, which into their facility, which they've never done before. Right. Uh, and then what you do is you say, okay, you got to average 40,000. Well, if I'm Vanderbilt, I'm like, okay, uh, we're going to schedule better. Well, we're also, it's hard for them to because they're kind of landlocked, but we're going to schedule better non conference opponents that their fans will travel for a home game. Right. You know, and then you want to play Alabama and you want to play because I've, I've seen huge crowds. Of course, I don't think their stadium holds 30, 40, at least right now, right. but I've seen so, sellouts there. But if there's 40,000 people, 10 are rooting for Vanderbilt and the others are, you know, rooting for the other team, but okay, that works. But anyway, the point is I'm getting at, you're going to have to meet certain financial obligations to be able to, and make certain um, financial commitments. Yep. Like, like to, to be able to eat at the trough. Obi, I'm not the smartest guy, right? But I feel like this doesn't need to take five years to figure out. Like, Put a plan in the place. What is the General Patton? Um, here, I actually was reading a book where the General Patton's statement came out. I'm going to read it out to you, OB, because this is what I think they need to do with, um, uh, with college football. A good plan executed violently now is better than a perfect plan executed a week from now. 
don't take your time. Figure. I mean, you can't do it next year, but like put a timeline. In three years, this is the new world well, of college I, yeah, football, right. and we'll figure it out by next summer and set an agenda. Yeah, and move yeah. on. Yeah, I don't know what the contracts are, you know, and TVs and things sure, like that. Sure. Uh, but you could set it up, and then what you have is you have the ACC and and the Big Twelve saying, okay, how do we get in on this? And then you got the Mountain West and all those guys saying, but 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 but. And it just makes sense. You're going to call it, we've talked about it before, you're going to call it like Super Division One, yep. right? And then you still, the NCAA still has Division One. You still have a national champion Division One. It's just Division One now includes Baylor and Oregon State, or maybe Baylor gets in with the Big 12. Who knows? But it includes Oregon State and Washington State. And Do you think this plan by uh, Sankey Petiti is going to include other conferences or just those two? I don't know. Like, let's would, just make our own thing, our own NFL. We'll keep it to our teams. We'll have our own national championship. If those well, guys want to do I, their I, own thing. They, they, I, they probably want Notre Dame involved. Yeah. You know? And Notre Dame wants to be involved. And you probably want to have a couple ACC teams. Yeah. Maybe not all of them. You know, there's certain places that you, you, they might be uh, feeling a little bit uh, concerned by all this. Well, does that mean – Back to your original does, point. Does Georgia Tech really deserve a spot at the table? You know, I mean, I would have no problem with, with them taking the whole ACC. But they're also going to be saying, yeah, but you're going to be uh, operating under our rules. Because uh, why does Florida State want out of the ACC so bad? Because North Carolina runs it, and it's basketball. And the uh, it's a basketball conference. And the uh, uh, Florida State and Clemson's making all the money for them. Yeah. But, you know, not getting it as much or what they feel like is the right, right share. Yeah, look, I'm glad that finally it feels more than just, hey, we're going to have meetings and we're going to go to Congress and we're going to do this. And we're gonna, like, all right, we are putting our heads together. We're going to figure yeah. it out. There'll be lawsuits filed to try to prevent it if that's sure. what they decide to break off. But the, the NCAA for years has been a just a, a hood ornament. Let has, them run the NCAA tournament. Well, actually, you don't even have to do that if you break off. Look, we're going to have our own tournament, and maybe the NCAA has its, and then maybe at the end of the year you negotiate something where you go, hey, the the national champion of the of the Super League versus the national championship of the NCAA for the world championship. You know, you know they do what you're talking about in soccer, by do the they? way. They do. Yeah. Uh, and nobody watches that. They watch – the Champions League, which is like the Super League. They watch that Super League championship, and then there's this cl- uh, World Cup of Clubs that like nine people watch. And it's, you know, it's played in part of the year that nobody cares. Like, it's, it's, it's just a different, it's a different vibe. Um, and I think that's where college football is headed. It's, it, it is headed to a Super League, if you will. But a Super League that might be 40 teams, might be 60 teams. Well, I think, again... I wouldn't be surprised if they put some parameters on each school. What you've got to do to to, to be stay. to be able to, um, you know, to be able to be at the trough. You know, it's like uh, I was at a uh, a big lunch one time or a dinner. Actually, there's about a dozen of us, and you know, I, everybody wants to split the bill evenly. Mm-hmm. Except there's the one guy that said, "Yeah, well, all I could afford was a salad, so I don't want to have to." So if you're that salad guy. You might, you might get pushed out for somebody else that can pay his share of the bill. Yep. Good point there, OB. All right, let's hit a break. We'll come back. We'll listen to uh, some text messages there at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Right now we're talking 12 under 12. Did you or someone you know graduate from A&M within the last 12 years, and you're leading by example in business and in service? The Association of Former Students would like to invite you to nominate yourself or someone you know for the 12 under 12 Young Alumni Spotlight. So each year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of A&M's core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Previous year honorees have included leaders in business and higher education, architects, petroleum engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, and veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces 2024 nominations close Sunday, March 31st, so be sure to submit a nomination soon. To learn more about the recognition and submit a nomination, visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations.
How are you reeling it in? I'm reeling in the years. Yeah. I've reeled them almost. I've reeled in 62 of them. Boomer! <laughs> it's me. Tex X Radio, presented by David Gardner, Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. We go back to the Angry Elephant News and Social Sensor. Mr. Dawson, I know we got some text messages to uh, help close out the hour. Yeah, so Jim in Temple says three or four of Coach Golden's players actually looked older than Todd. His nickname for him is Frat Boy. Ob, do you have a nickname for this Florida head coach? No, I mean I I actually had no issue with him at all until that press conference when he when he started whining and about again if you if more than half of your shots are three pointers and your other and your opponent is consistently attacking the rim, it stands to reason mm-hmm. that you are going to shoot fewer free throws. Also, when you complain that, hey, I couldn't talk to my team because a player on A&M, and I know you didn't say which player it was, I didn't see it, was yakking at our bench. I'm like, so what you're telling me is you're kind of soft mentally because that messed that you up. You. And, okay, it's good to know. If I'm the, I just wouldn't complain. If about I'm the it. Florida athletic director, I think I'm making a note about that. So this is what I tell my kids. Whenever somebody's disrespectful. So he was at San Francisco before, so I'm sorry. But I tell my kids, I was like, just make a mental note, and then on the next play or the next possession, give them a little elbow. Like, if you got a problem, like, I'm not going to go on a press conference and be like, and they were yelling at me. Yeah, it's It's stupid. It's like. Say it like that. Say stupid. I don't know. Try it, try it. It's It's stupid. It's stupid. Of the Power Six conferences, Coach Golden's actually the second youngest head coach. How old is he? He's, old, he's, 20, he's 37. 37. And the youngest is actually John Shire, Chicago native, Glenbrook North, rival so, of Deerfield High School. Eric Musselman has enough skins on the wall for me to like put up with his act, but he whines a lot too. Oh, man. Remember yeah. Will Wade? That guy just bugged me on the sidelines. And, and Will Wade didn't bother me. He really didn't. He bugged me. Musselman does, especially you know when he complains about a foul, when your guy, it's on video, was kicking your, the A&M guy in the nads. And you're going to say, oh, how can you call that? Well, because the <laughs> foot went in the nether regions. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. It's not pretty. I mean, it's a pretty obvious call. You know, it's on ball foul, actually, on, on two. Yeah, and let's build on that. Bob and Brian sends. Building on the balls. Go ahead. <laughs> building on that. Uh, Bob and Brian says Florida coach Golden didn't whine about the first half calls. He says Florida shot 13 to 14 free throws. Now, I don't know if that number's right, but a and only shot four. But the point is, Florida shot more free throws than A&M. And by the way, A&M, I believe, is first in the SEC in free throw attempts. So this is nothing new. I just hope they start making them again. Yeah. Yeah, they need to make them more. Of course, it depends on who you get to the line. But, you know, if what I thought was going to happen on that last play is I'm thinking, I mean, before the, 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 the turnover, I thought Wade's going to inbound it. There, somebody's going to throw it right back to Wade. He's going to get fouled. He's going to make free throws. Yep. You know? Because he's the guy you always want at the foul line. By the way, when I look at Boots' stat, stat line, what I love about it was, yeah, he, he, to me, I, he's not a reliable three-point shooter. He is, that's not the right way to phrase it. He's streaky, right? When he's on, he's on. But he only took three, and he made two of the three. But he took 16 shots in that game, and 16 shots, 13 of those were going downhill, or most for the most part. You know what I think is significant is that A&M only took 15 threes. Now, how many games have we seen them 20-plus and, right. and, and just not making them? They didn't shoot a, a great percentage. They shot 26.7%. Again, you know, still a, a pedestrian uh, percentage, but they didn't shoot as many, so it didn't hurt them. You're right. You're exactly right. Uh, Matthew, what else? Anything? Well, one more text from Matt in San Antonio. Massive win for the Ags. You never know if being on the right side of a 67-66 game could very well be the difference between 10-8 and 8 in the SEC and comfortable in the SEC tournament. We're 9-9 and on the bubble, and we know that A&M does not do well being on the yeah, bubble yeah, in college not. playoff brackets. What a and needs to do from now on is win the games that you're supposed to win, and then you're going to have to you know, go off and – Pull off an upset. I think you're, you're supposed to win uh, against at Vanderbilt Missouri. at yep. Missouri. You're supposed to win at home against Arkansas. I think you're supposed to win. They'll be favored probably against Georgia and uh, at home against Mississippi State. So that will give you how many wins? I think right now they're four and four, so that'd make you nine and nine. So then you know you got to steal something. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to upset somebody, and th- you know this team's perfectly capable. Does nine and nine get them in the tournament? 
I don't want to risk it. Yeah. I think I think you want to get 10 and 8 to feel good. Yeah. I think you do. I read I think Hop somebody wrote on the boards that uh, A&M's uh, uh metric went down. Yeah, be- it did. Because of Memphis. Memphis just you know, hitting 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 the bad part of their season. Oh, be great job, buddy. All right. When we come right. back on Texags Radio, Tom Hart is going to be joining us. We'll talk chit chat with Tom Hart. The Knicks got a confusing topic to get into at nine thirty five. Just kidding, Nick. Trisha Ford joining us for the first time this year. Uh, we will talk to Trisha here at nine forty seven ish, nine fifty ish in that range. Billy Lucci will join us with Buzz Williams to start off the ten o'clock hour. And by the way, National Signing Day. Uh, this the late one coming up here on Wednesday. We'll talk a little bit about that throughout the show because it was a good weekend. I was for at A&M. a breakfast place where uh, Terry Bussey was about ten feet from me. Did you give him a high five? I didn't. Sit, didn't. No. Didn't even try to get his attention. All right. I heard Scotty Pippen I think was that in might town be recently. counterproductive. Well, he was. Yeah. All right, we're gonna hit a break. We will come back with more. It's Texas Radio.
And we are back here on Tex Ags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the Brian Foley Law Hotline. We're joined by our buddy Tom Hart of the SEC Network and ESPN. Tom, good morning, buddy. Good morning. Did you watch the Grammys last night? Uh, so let me let me phrase it like this: The Grammys were on because I have daughters that love Taylor Swift, and I caught parts of the Grammys. I I caught Luke Combs performing with Tracy Chapman, which I thought that was, you know, it was all right. It was cool. It's a good song. Um, I caught Jay Z, Hove, right, and that's important to me. I, I, I like Jay Z, and everything else. I I caught a little bit of U two. Okay. They looked. They, I was. It was weird to see them as old as they are now. Like that was I had been a while. But yeah, I mean, not so. Basically, I answered you by saying, "Yeah, I caught it, but I wasn't watching. I was walking by." You? I uh, I totally forgot they were on. So we we whiffed on it. We were watching a random Netflix movie, and then flipped over in time for the. Uh, I think it was a Stevie Wonder tribute to, uh, like the in memoriam. He did he did the Tony Bennett tribute, and they had Tony Bennett singing as well, like his audio. And I realized that. that Coupled with, um, gosh, who was it? Somebody did a Tina Turner tribute that that Oprah introduced, and then the Tracy Chapman song. Like it's the only award show where you actually get live performances. Like if if it's the Academy Awards and Morgan Freeman got on stage and presented a scene from his movie, <laughs> that, like okay, that's cool. You can't do that, you know, for the Oscars. But all of these live performances and um, I was watching with one of my teenage daughters. Taylor Swift in the crowd reacting to these performances is kind of like what you see NBA dudes in the dunk contest. Yeah. Like, even when I can do it, like, it just blows my mind that that guy just did it. And I'm so excited for my teammate or the dude who's playing for that other team that just threw down this nasty dunk. Like, that, she was fun to watch. Like, I, I'm... It's more fun to watch me for me to watch her in that setting than it is in other settings, I think. Could you imagine a Grammys world where they took an NBA slam dunk contest approach to where like, look, I'm an established superstar. I don't perform here. Sorry. Uh, we're going to let the, the B and C team dunkers get out here. So LeBron would be Taylor Swift or whatever, right? That she wouldn't perform because it's the Grammys is beneath her. Well, I, I think to, 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 pay it forward a little bit um given the some of the performers we saw i mean travis scott notwithstanding um but like and so i missed so you two performed i missed that yeah um because i tuned in late like i said it would be like having a dunk contest and having dr j and tracy mcgrady in it right <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're really talking about like hey jay you think you could say hey what's dominique doing this weekend can we get dominique in the dunk contest Spud Web, come here. on let's that's kind of <laughs> it's Bud Web out there. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, hey, but it's still it. Maybe maybe I like it because it's nostalgic. But it was a lot of fun. Which it's well. First off, what Netflix movie were you watching? I'm interested. Uh, the Marky Mark movie, the Mark Wahlberg movie, where he's a dad that's also a former assassin. Oh, that was okay. I like that. That's a family yeah. movie. It was alright. Great family movie. Like we watched it with the kids. It was entertaining. Him, you know, <laughs> driving a minivan like he's driving a Dodge Charger was a lot of fun. But yeah, good, wholesome Sunday night movie. I haven't finished it yet, but We Are the World documentary, pretty good. Pretty good. Is it pretty? Yeah, that's on the list. That's on the list. That looks awesome. Pro Bowl, any time at all watching the Pro Bowl? <laughs> no, none. <laughs> no, no, didn't even sniff it. Um, um, part of it is the, the NFL is such a behemoth, right? But I really feel like this weekend, especially with some of the matchups we had, was college basketball's coming out party. I talk about this a lot, but there's several opening days to college basketball season, right? There's November 7th or 9th when people start playing, and then there's the end of the college football regular season where more casual fans go, oh, um, no college football on this weekend. Let's see what the teams are up to. And then there's the after the national championship, more fans cross over. And then there's the weekend prior to the Super Bowl and after the Super Bowl, like two other starting dates. But no NFL on a weekend. Loaded slate of uh, top 10 matchups, four of them. I had uh, Tennessee at Kentucky, which was turned into kind of a blowout, honestly. Uh, but I just thought it was a great weekend for college hoops to kind of grab the nation's attention. 
Well, we'll start with A&M. Much needed victory. I mean, we talked about it last week, how big this game was going to be for the Aggies. They get it, and they get it with Boots kind of going back to his bag and attacking the rim and doing what Boots does. Yeah, I, I thought two things, and I've, I've actually got it on my uh, DVR right now because I just started watching it. Uh, two things in the paint. Not only did A&M score in the paint, but they shut down Florida in the paint. Florida was averaging like 40 points in the paint. And it's not just the bigs. They've got a really, as you can see, like they've got an elite backcourt. Um, and those guys do a great job of attacking. And I had the number down here somewhere. Um, Florida only scored 18 in the paint. They're averaging 40, fourth best in the country. So to shut off that spigot defensively, I think, was a big part of big part of that. And, I mean, Florida put 40 on them in the first half. That was a pretty good offensive first half for the Gators, who are a really, really good team. And Todd Golden's a great coach. A&M still has Tennessee here in a couple games coming up, right? But how important is it? And we all know it's important, but to, to just string together a couple of wins, right? Like, because yeah. this team seems like they'll go up and then they, they hit the spot where, like, we're not sure. Uh, Tennessee is going to be mammoth. And I think this team can beat a Tennessee team when they play their best because they, they do play well in these big games. But getting the games against the teams on your schedule that you should beat. So I've got the Aggies next two games. So I'll, I'll see them in Columbia on Wednesday night. Uh, a Mizzou team that has not won a conference game. Um, you know their their coaches. Dennis Gates said the other day he's going. You know we've got to start taking responsibility for our for our actions. So we can't just say the other team played great. They're not in a great spot right now and lost to Arkansas this weekend. So that that's got to be a must win. And anytime you get a road W in this league, that's something to be appreciated. And then I'll be there for the Tennessee game Saturday night. Um, the what you're talking about right now is something we talk about all the time, and it it applies even to football, but especially I think to basketball. And that if you are a middle of the pack team, fourth through tenth in the league right now, maybe eleventh because I think you know LSU is not bad. Um, there are opportunities to collect wins more. And I hate using the word quit, but more and more the mental hurdle for teams when things aren't going well is so much higher than it's ever been because they haven't played together, right? There's, there's less team chemistry these days than we've ever seen. Um, these relationships have to be fast tracked when you've got a brand new roster, when you've got coaches that have more, I think have more change over than ever before. So it's, how can you accelerate those relationships to build a team and build a program? Arkansas is a great example of, you know, they, they tried to build it quickly with all these new guys and it hasn't worked. So the point is there are wins available against equal or even more talented teams if you play as a team, and I think that's Buzz's strength, like even when they've been great, he said, listen, we're not a, a great, we're not great individually. Uh, I don't, I'm not the best coach in the world, but as a staff, we're really good. We don't have the best roster in the world, but as a team, we're really good. And that's who they've got to be um, because two guards who can score and a guy inside who's undersized, but the best rebounder in the SEC, and then all these supplemental parts, that's how they got to win. And wins are available against middle of the pack teams that are your equal from a talent standpoint. I'm going to ask Buzz, and I don't know if he knows the why behind it, but this team the last couple of years comes February and they start ascending. I, I just yeah. think it's like, and OB kind of described it as he, he, at this point he knows what guys do well and he knows how to push the right buttons. And it sometimes takes a little bit longer than we want, especially with what, what, what they had coming back this year. But it's February. We'll see if it continues to be a trend every year, but we've seen it the last two. Well, I credit coaching, and it, it goes right back to what we are just talking about. You know, like, let's use a, another term that we sometimes this applies to running backs, right? They're like, oh, he gets stronger as the game goes on. No, that's not the case. Or, you know, the fastball has late life. No, it decreases in velocity. It's just relative to other fastballs that you see, right? He gets stronger as the game goes on. No, he doesn't. Nobody does. He just doesn't – elite running backs just don't have the drop-off that others do when they get tired and it turns into the fourth quarter. So what I think you've seen from A&M over the years is, is Buzz has this magnetic ability as a coach to keep the program moving in the right direction where others either plateau or start going down. Um, and it's 
So it's all relative to what the competition is doing, right? And I think that's a – yes, it's about learning your team and getting in the right spot and, and learning strengths and building guys up. Um, but a big part of it is being able to coach your guys hard without them getting frustrated or getting down and getting – a quick example. I was at Auburn film session um, earlier this week, and Bruce Pearl told his guys, we will be great if you don't get sick of me. And I was like, well, that's, it. that's kind of a weird message to give your guys. But his point was well taken. Like, if you continue to take coaching – and if, if I deliver in a way, it's on the coach, if I deliver in a way that it's accepted, then we're, we're all going to move in the same direction. But if you stop taking coaching or I deliver it in a bad way and you stop being coached by me, then we can't be a successful program. And, I, you know, so you can't get sick of me as a head coach and I've got to treat you right as a player. And I, I think Buzz has those qualities. I think what you said there hit hit it right in the head when it comes to buzz because you have to deliver a message that these guys can absorb. And that's why I think it's so important for buzz that he recruits a certain type of player, right? Like, of course he wants five and four stars. Who doesn't, right? But the right guys for his program that, that will take the messaging the way his tough love, arm around you kind of style that he has. I see it every day. And it's, um, it's fascinating because every coach has a different approach. Every coach has, you know, different resumes and different strengths and weaknesses. But uh, you have seen Kentucky lose twice in the last two weeks, uh, one on the road to South Carolina and then losing at home to Tennessee, which they allowed 102 points. And um, their defense has just been horrendous. And people say, well, why isn't, he, why isn't John Calipari a, a better defensive coach? Why isn't he harder on his guys? And it's his approach generally is I keep building my guys up, keep building my guys up. They're, they've got all the talent in the world. I don't want them to get down. I don't want them to doubt themselves. Um, sometimes he's a guy who who plays a player maybe longer than he should, waiting for him to have a breakout game. Um, so it's all about how you deliver your message, but I think most importantly, how that message is going to be received. And coaches, the great coaches know that. They know it's not just what I'm saying, it's who I'm saying it to and how they're going to accept it. Well, we, we learned that with A&M football, right? Like, Certainly oh, yeah. five stars, it's very difficult to coach them hard um, or expect for defense because when you're a five-star basketball player, you're probably out there to score some points. Uh, you've never been asked to play a lot of defense. The blue-collar guys have been. I'll give you a great example. Um, Michael Porter Jr. has been in the news uh, lately, but he you know, spent a year at Missouri, grew up in Columbia, generally speaking, after a year away. Um, had a lot of hometown support to be a, a five-star guy playing for his home team. And he really struggled in the first couple of months with the program. And it, his dad was on the staff, but his mom was asked about it, asked about how hard it is to play for Conzo Martin. And Conzo is a very demanding coach, uh, but not so much what I'm about to say. And, and her response was, well, it's been really hard for Michael because when they run sprints, coach makes him touch the line. And he's never had to touch the line before. If anybody's played for a coach that has an ounce of discipline, and there's, there's guys that peaked in high school right now that are nodding their head listening to this, you don't touch the line when running suicides, everybody's doing it again. Mm -hmm. You try to take a shortcut, and it costs not just you but your teammates, boy, that's how you learn discipline, right? That's how it's instilled in you and pounded into you. And if you're a dude like Michael Porter Jr., and no coach has ever made you touch the line in suicides, then when finally your college coach does, it's hard to receive that, right? Like, I've been treated a certain way my entire life. I'm the best guy on the court. Why well, I got to touch the line? Well, those are the team rules. Tom, earlier this year, Tennessee, they had an interesting non-conference start, but they have figured it all out, man. Talk to me. You saw them up close against Kentucky. Just how, how good are they? They're elite, and, and what makes them elite is the combination of Rick Barnes' coach defense, uh, number two defensive efficiency going into the game this weekend. Uh, but, but what has held Barnes' teams back over the years has been offensive execution and innovation. Uh, they spend a lot of time on defense. The offensive inefficiencies have been there at times throughout Barnes' career. Most famously – Right, he had Kevin Durant. He's in a big game. He comes over to the huddle. I think this was at Kansas in KD's lone year uh, in Austin. And he goes, all right, KD, go make a play. That's the play. That's what we drew up, right? And he goes out there and makes a play and they win the game. 
Uh, one final four for Barnes. This is looking like another final four team because they have Dalton Connect, who can absolutely score. Uh, he's a, not a Durant clone. Nobody is, but that's his favorite player. He's got great length. He finishes at the rim. He had six straight games, averaging 32 in this league. Um, so what was missing from Tennessee for years was a go-to player at the end of the clock, at the end of the game. They've got that guy now. Yeah, they certainly do. Is it time to panic for Kentucky, though? We talked about, you know, building his guys up. But, you know, a couple losses to some pretty good teams. I don't think it is, but that's not what they expect there at Kentucky. I'm going to put this in a generational term. But remember what happened in Tokyo when Mike Tyson was fumbling around for his mouthpiece mm. after Buster Douglas put him on the mat? Or remember what happened at, towards the end of Tiger's dominance? Once teams learn – they or individuals learned they could beat those guys and they lost their aura. Yep. They lost the fear. Things change. It's no longer fearful to go into Rupp Arena. They've lost back to back games at Rupp eight times in program history. That's it. Back to back eight times. And they've been playing since 1908, 1909, something like that. Uh, Rupp's been around for 40, 50 years. Three of those times have come in, in the last uh, two seasons. So, if you don't fear going into Rupp Arena, where South Carolina won last year, then then that says something about the state of that program. But mostly it's because defensively they're just not attached to the detail that it takes to win big games. They just That's not in their DNA. Um, and until they fix that, the, their long-term viability doesn't look good. That being said, this is absolutely a team that could be a nine seed and beat a one the first weekend. Like they have the talent. They got seven NBA dudes on that roster. They could beat anybody in the country. Maybe they could lose to anybody in the country too. Tom, last thing for you. Caleb Williams um, was happy for Cliff Kingsbury. I don't know if you know, the commanders have the second pick in the draft. Could you see them kind of linking up in the future? I am so torn on Caleb Williams. Mm -hmm. I understand the lottery ticket mentality of programs that if, if you get that quarterback right that turns into that guy then all of a sudden especially at the beginning of his career the salary cap is structured in a way that you have an, an incredible advantage over the rest of the league look look at Mahomes early on um I just don't know that he's that dude like I I, I the plenty of people will have freezing cold takes that say you know, otherwise, either way. But I just – there's always a risk. We know the hit rate on quarterbacks in the draft and how uh, how low that hit rate is. The difference is if you hit, that's generational wealth for you and everybody in the program. So good for both of them, I suppose, is how I'll put that. Tom, appreciate you, brother. Thanks so much. All right, Dave. Good to see you, bro. Great seeing you too. Tom Hart there, SEC Network there on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. Appreciate his time. We'll hit a break. We will come back with some more. We'll do a round of Aggieland. Kay Nagley will be joining us. But before we do that, let's chit-chat about our friends at QC Kinetics. If you're sick and tired of achy joints, and by the way, you should be, and you want to go back to living life the right way, dread the idea of surgery, you need to call QC Kinetics today. The state of healthcare is always changing. The old ideas like steroids and surgery, those are old ideas that aren't the best options anymore. There are no, no longer your only options. Regenerative medicine at QC Kinetics is transforming lives with innovative, non-surgical, drug-free treatments that deliver lasting results. Knee pain, back pain, shoulder pain from arthritis or injury. Don't let this pain keep you from living your best life out there. QC Kinetics has state-of-the-art treatments that harness and direct your body's natural ability to restore and repair that damaged tissue. This is a revolutionary approach that can get you long-term relief with no downtime. May 2024, the year you reclaim your mobility, reclaim your independence, walk, run, play, and live without the danger of trauma and surgery and without harmful drugs. Call QC Kinetics for a free consultation today. 979-452-6000. QC Kinetics, 979-452-6000. That is 
All right, we're back here on Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, 911 University Drive East in College Station. They got Rolexes for both men and women. Stop by David Gardner's to meet with a certified Rolex specialist there. Uh, David Yerman collectors also need to go by there. Shop online at davidgardnersjewelers.com. It is now time for Around Aggieland, presented by Normandy State Bank. Normandy State Bank, rock solid banking. The website is normandystatebank.com. And with that, we have... Kate Nagley. Good morning. Good so morning. I heard your Grammys takes. And what, what did I say? I wasn't rude, was I? Fast Car was amazing. It was okay. It was good. It was right. It was. That's such a good song. It's a great it song. Be, it's a really good song. Yeah, but I'm, like, uh, if but it was overplayed this year. Okay, that's just because Luke Combs did the cover of it. Yeah. But the it, original, it, which, but the OG with her singing. Pretty good. You like that one? I did. My kids I did. hate it. They're like, who is this woman singing Fast Car? Oh, like the original no. lady? I just remember growing up with that playing. And... No way you were alive when that was playing. <laughs> I'm old now. I'm no not. No way. What? It, what Dawson, year did look it up come the year out? that song came out. I was a kid. You weren't born. <laughs> I swear. Right, unless your parents are listening to the oldie station, no I mean, chance. Yeah, some old country. I feel like that was probably on the radio. I mean, no. That had to have come out in like. Oh no! The original, no chance. 1988, no chance. Okay, I'm. I was born in 2001, so. 13 years later, it would be an oldie. <laughs> yeah, like but Jay-Z, I just, that's I old do music to you, right? Remember listening, yes, Jay Z okay. is old music. I do remember listening to that song growing up, though. I know that as her version, not obviously Luke's, which. Your kids probably will grow up thinking it's Luke's version. Luke's version, but. for sure, yeah. Oh, I'll defend no. Kay. I mean, we have parents, yeah. right? I mean, I have, yeah. I, I, I have like Willie Nelson like playing. Whenever I come home, I get I get Alabama and Willie Nelson. Yeah, but the way yeah. she phrased it was like, I remember that on the radio. Okay. Like, yeah, you On the oldie station. You're telling me they're not playing songs on the radio that are 13 years old? At Candy 95? Okay, at whatever station. I feel like they'll play some Everyone, throwbacks. They, they'll go, time for the old school remix. Boom! Like, you know, like they have little s- sound effects. They don't just like mix it in. Like, hey, go oh, slide man. in this one. Also, on the play Grammys. the Beatles. I'm sure you heard the Beatles on the radio in the 1960s, too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if I was around back in my back in my day. And Taylor Swift dropped is, or announced a new album. And that was so such a marketing thing. Me and all the other annoying people you know are super excited well, about it. Well, okay. We got to move on because we, yeah. we have a. a, a, a an audience that doesn't watch The View as much as you would think, okay? Mm-hmm. But why was Beyonce not nominated? Why was Jay- I mean, I understand why Jay-Z was mad about that. Well, Wasn't did, her album amazing or something? Did she, I don't know if it like qualified for uh, this gotcha. year. Okay. So that's, all right. that's why. All right. I'm done with Grammy talk. Anyways, yeah, let's move on. This Aggie actual, talk. We're all in. Aggie sports. We have National Signing Day coming up this week. Is that on, coming up? It's two days away on Wednesday, so stay tuned for all the updates. I know we have a ton of recruiting interviews going out right now for 25 and 26 guys. Um, and then hopefully we can reel Terry Bussey in. I know he was here this weekend. Um, that would be the perfect way to cap off the class for Mike Elko. Um, and then some moving on, some basketball news. Tyrese Radford poured on a game-high 26 points as the Aggies won that game against Florida 67-66, to barely pulled it out. Um, on Saturday afternoon, they are now back to 500 in SEC play, and they will head to Columbia, Missouri for a battle with Mizzou. That is on Wednesday this week. Mm-hmm. Not They usually play on Tuesday, but they'll be on Wednesday at 8 p.m. You heard Tom Hart say he's going to be calling the action, so make sure to tune in. And then women's basketball, and unfortunately – Alarming 22 turnovers played Joni Taylor's Aggies offensively, just couldn't get anything going, and then allowed Mississippi State to head home victorious 64-63. to um, To hopefully return just below 500 in the conference, they will play um, Ole Miss on the road. That will be on Thursday, so make sure to tune in. And then softball, we have some softball this week. We've got Trisha it's, Ford on the show in a little we bit. We do. Trisha, Trisha Ford will begin her second season in Aggieland this Friday with the Aggie Classic that will be stretching over the course of the weekend. They are taking on Valpo, Lehigh, and Lehigh. Tulsa. So I was like, hmm, those are some interesting names that we don't hear too much that Aggie Sports are playing. And then also on the Diamond, baseball is just 11 days out. I know we have a ton of baseball content coming for y'all. Um, that should be super exciting. And then also on the track, the track and field program claimed 12 of event wins on the final day of the Charlie Thomas Invitational. That was here in Aggieland. Um, and the women's 4x400 Log the sixth fastest time in the nation, coming home in 3.30.37. That is 
crazy to run a 400 oh man that's that's pretty nuts so good to see them killing it on the track and then hopefully we can have some good good signing day and then a couple more basketball wins this week would be excellent okay great job of course and you watched the whole Grammy thing? I did watch the entire thing. Yeah. Normally, I'm not a pop culture person like that, but I was I was locked Is in. Is it because your girls are? They yeah. Showed every five well, seconds. I know she was gonna gonna pick up some awards. So and supposedly she was supposed to release her old re-release her old album, and then she just threw us a curveball, and now it's a new album, which is great too. I like that hoodie, by the way. Thank you, Texas and Basketball. I'm representing. Gig him. Whoop. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll have Buzz Williams, by the way, on the show at 10 o'clock with Billy here in a little bit. Right now, we're talking Millicum Reserve, a farm to table community. They're in College Station. They got homes, they got trails, they got wide open spaces. And their mission is to build a healthy community around nature. And they are committed to trading lightly on that land that they're found on. Millicum Reserve is creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and for community. 2,600 acres of open space, farms, and trails. Beautiful place to go hang out out there, especially with those uh, extensive network of trails throughout that wooded landscape that you can go walking, you can see the equestrian paths, the creeks, the ponds, the gathering areas. It's a great place for families to come together generation after generation. And when you go there, don't be surprised if you see some white-tailed deer, songbirds, rabbits, turtles, all the animals you can imagine. Not giraffes. I haven't seen any of those, but you can certainly see a bunch of great animals when you go to Millicum Reserve, when you go hiking, when you go biking, when you go canoeing, when you go kayaking, when you go to the equestrian trails, the evening yoga, the summer camps, the music festivals, the farmer markets, and the farm tours. You can learn more about Millicum Reserve by visiting their website. I highly recommend you visit the location first, but if you want to check it out on the website, MillicumReserve.com. Again, that website, MillicumReserve.com.
Good song. No matter who you are. Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner Shields Rollo Insurance Studio. I do want to read Emily's uh, message here. I hear them play plenty of 10-plus-year-old songs over at Candy. Our studios are right next door to each other. Yeah, they do. I actually have heard some old-school songs. But I think when you make the comment, I remember it on the radio when I was growing up. Like It sounds like you, you listened to it when it was like a jam, if you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, we got Trisha Ford coming on here in about 13 minutes or so. But uh, let's do a little around the SEC. The Knicks got a topic for us to kind of throw around. Uh, Matthew Dawson there at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Hello, sir. Hello. We were just talking a lot about basketball, and I do want to reiterate like how good Tennessee is. We play him twice. Tom was bringing up that Dalton Connect has been really good, but he he didn't even like he wasn't the leading scorer. Like they had two players that were not named Dalton Connect or Connect against Kentucky, scored twenty six points. So that was incredible for them. South Carolina at men's basketball just they, they just win. They beat Georgia again, seventy two sixty two. They're looking like really good. It was that their nineteenth win of the year? That's crazy. Arkansas continues to lose. I mean, and we continue to be their only win in SEC play, mm. which is unfortunate. Auburn beat Ole Miss handily. They were down uh, in the second half pretty big, but then they, or sorry, in the first half really big, and they came back in the second half and figured out how to win that ball game right there. And let's talk NFL draft. In Daniel Jeremiah's top 50, which is, you know, a big deal to me, uh, 15th players in the SEC, 19 if you count Texas and Oklahoma. That's a big deal. One of them being, of course, Edge Cooper, who he ranks at 20th, is the only linebacker in the top, or great as a first-round prospect. I'll tell you this fact, too. Daniel Jeremiah, in the last couple years, six out of the seven linebackers that he graded as a first-round draft pick have gone in the first round. The only exception is Jeremiah wusu Koromoa, who just came off a career year with 100 tackles. He's playing for the Cleveland Browns, so that's pretty exceptional. Pretty good, pretty, pretty good. I didn't watch Curb last night. Gosh, dog it. I just re- realized that when I made my pretty good statement. Go ahead. No, th- that's that's it for around the SEC right there. Oh, actually, one more. Spencer Rattler, MVP of the Senior Bowl. Forgot to mention that in the Senior Bowl. Segment. Yeah. So that was pretty awesome. SEC player. We'll see if he ends up uh, climbing his draft stock. I'm trying sure. to remember. I feel like John Harris said he didn't have a great week leading up to that. I believe he said that. Don't quote me on that. Go back and listen to the podcast and tell me how right I am or how wrong I am. All right, let's go uh, behind the glass and talk with Nick Savage. Nick, you've got a topic that I want you to explain in yeah, full. Yeah, I'm going to try my very best and take it as slow as I can because I confused everybody back here this morning when, okay. I, when I thought it out loud. But thankfully, I have Kay Nagley right behind me who is the, has a better way with words than I do. So I was thinking, you know, last night, I was just pondering, coming up with show topics, and I thought of what Aggies that are in the NFL right now current NFL players, which one or who would I want to come back and play one more season at A&M? So they got to be on an NFL roster. Come back this year, though. This year. Yeah, this, sure. This the, year. The, this version of them right now season. as a grown man, right? Yeah. yeah. To play on Mike Elko's team. 100%. Yeah. Okay. So, like, for instance, if I wanted to do, I don't know, uh, Kenyon Green. Hundred. I, yep. Okay. Bam. Bam. Plug but, him in. But the only way this works is if we do a draft. Okay. Between four of us. Kane Egley, yourself, me. Well, Kane doesn't have a mic. We can do She can just yell it. You'll, okay. You'll, you'll, you got it. Uh, yeah, that's true. I can hear. All right. So because, I mean, uh, uh, hello. Miles Garrett. Game over. Okay. I won. David gets first pick. I get second pick. Uh, yeah, I got to go. Got to go Mike Evans there. Pretty, pretty an easy, uh, pretty easy pick. Matthew has a mic, so he gets third pick. Gay gets oh. the last pick because oh, she likes K. Taylor Swift. Oh, poor Kay. What, what is it, Matthew? Give me a chance. H have to. Okay. Love it. That, 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 that'd be a great one. He knows the players chemistry-wise. Let's see, I see where you're going there, GM. All right, KK. K Nagley, what's the pick? With the fourth pick in the first round, K Nagley selects Justin Matabike. I think that's a great one. Second round? All right, second round. Let me think. Um, Christian Kirk. Christian Kirk? Okay. Ooh, see, do I, go, do I go quarterback here or do I go another wide receiver? I'm going to go quarterback. Give me Ryan Tannehill. Okay. Ooh, interesting. I'm going to take Eric McCoy. Okay. At center. Bill Neo line. K. Nagley. David picked, yeah. Uh, you picked, uh, who'd you pick, David? Sorry. I remember. Oh, Josh Reynolds. Josh Reynolds. He picked Josh Reynolds. She wants. <laughs> Love the dead air. <laughs> you don't have a mic, remember, K. Yeah. Let me, let me just give her people. Okay. Yeah. How about uh, Jake Matthews? Sure. Jake right. Matthews. There's your pick, Kay. You ran out of time. All right. I think we're just going to go too deep on this one. All right. Uh, but 
I like the, the thought process behind it. And now, if we were to extend it a little bit. Here you go. I'll give you a sleeper, David, if you, if you, I wanted to think a Jaylen little bit Jones. deeper. Yeah, yeah, that's a good pick. I'm going to go, and to be honest, I don't know if he still is on their roster. I know the last team he was on was the Chiefs, but I'm going to go Armani Watts. I remember watching him uh, a couple years back, and he was just so much fun to watch. Cade in the back pointed out Justin Evans. I don't know if he's on an NFL roster currently, but he was for a while. So those two guys in the secondary. Yeah, he's on the Eagles. Uh, so, yeah, two guys that are really fun to watch that uh, I would love to see in that secondary again. Did someone say uh, Donovan Wilson as well? Yeah, Donovan, Donovan Wilson. Wilson. I'm going gonna, gonna to read you the names, all right, because I got the list in front of me. Jake Matthews, Justin Matabike, Tyrell Dodson, Von Miller, which did anybody draft oh, on? how'd we forget? What a bunch of weirdos. Trevion Williams, Miles Garrett, Jaden Peavy, Buddy Johnson, Donovan Wilson, Josh Reynolds, Kenyon Green, Jalen Jones, Antonio Johnson, Christian Kirk, Keaton Sutherland, Isaiah Sp- Isaiah Spiller? Come on, guys. Bobby Brown, uh, Devon A. Chain, Eric McCoy, we Randy. Build Bullock, a whole team. Michael Clemens. Dude, Michael Clemens? God. He's a, he's a man man. This is why we wouldn't be good GMs. Just well, I mean, I, I should have prepared for it. Justin uh, Evans, Braden Mann, DeMarvin Leal, Ryan McCullum, Dan Moore Jr., Mike Evans, Ryan Tannehill. That is, I think, the most up to date. Randy Bullock? Yeah, I was about was to say that. Did I not say him? Was he on that list? He's on the list. Okay. Yeah, I thought Sorry. I said him, but if I didn't, I skipped over it on accident. He's on the list. But I think it'd be interesting, though, if we went back to like certain eras of Aggie football and got yeah. one more year yeah, of well, Mike Evans in that era, what that next year yeah. could have looked like. That might be a future segment, right? Okay. You know, obviously, Johnny, had you been able to keep him for one more year and maybe somehow we could have gotten through to him. So when he got to the NFL, maybe, I don't know. So th- that, I think that'd be an interesting one. Or AC Law saying, you know what? I think he was out of eligibility. Now that I think about it. He, but another year of AC Law. Another year of uh, Joseph Jones. Those were some really good teams. So you, you could have... There's many ways you can skin this conversation. I like it, Nick. Um, but I think we had to make it a draft because, you know, we just start naming people. Uh, but Hey, that's why you're the host, David. You take ideas and you make them better. Or I make them worse. Kind of depends on how you look at it. But look. A lot of these names that we said, right, are having phenomenal, not only phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal careers, excuse me, but also like right now playing at an exceptional level, um, playing at a very, very high level. Like Donovan Wilson, we forgot to mention him because there's so many different Aggies doing great. Von Miller is going to be a Hall of Famer. Mike Evans is going to be a Hall of Famer. Um, I don't, I don't. Jake Matthews, does, what kind of love does he get on the offensive line? I mean, he's been several-time Pro Bowlers. He, he gets a lot of love. He gets is, a lot of love. Does he get Hall of Fame love, though? Uh, prob- probably not, but no, no. He, he gets love. I think it'd be really interesting, too, if you extended this draft in a huge draft and you just did all professional Aggie athletes and you did an entire draft based on, like, Nathan Evaldi's on there. You know, like, you just go through the that entire thing. That is a thing. summer project that we'll do, right? We'll do a show. Uh, we'll call it the... The Dog Days of Sports Desperate Draft for... Say yeah, that Matthew, is, Matthew is coming for your job, oh, I David. Know he, is. I, I, he is. By the way, uh, Richard Zane says you won the draft, Matthew. Thank you, Richard. Who'd you By have again? I had Devon Achan, and I had Eric McCoy. He says that was the winner. The McCoy pick was the winner. That, that, that's, that, that's if we allow Richard to choose the winner. Yeah. Okay. And I, don't, I think he's just been... Uh, Demoted. He, if I would have known he was in there, he could have participated in the draft. Richard is insanely qualified, by the way. I think we should trust what he says. Hmm. I, I don't mind giving you the championship on this one. I don't mind. Which was the one that Nick and I did? It was, well, it was me, you, and OB, and it was like a like a Aggie career draft, and I just completely botched it or something like that. I don't remember the exact topic, but I my first pick was just not right. But anyways, we don't have to dunk on me. No, we, move on. We won't. All right. Well, what we'll do is um, we will hit a break. Is there any text we want to get into before we hit a break? Because I think we also need to get ready for Trisha Ford. Anything you want to get into, Matthew, real quick before we hit a break? Uh, not really. Okay. I'll let you hit the break, David. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you for playing the game as I was trying to stall. Um, all right. Let's do that. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with uh, more here on Tech Sags Radio. Right now, we're talking about Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support. Their phone number at Ascend is an easy one, 979-933-8527. Don't replace it, lift it. We all have, well, I don't know if we all have, but a lot of us have driveways that have issues, right? You know, the concrete's a little bit raised, patio issues, let's just say raised. It looks like an eyesore. You've got other issues when it comes to concrete, or potentially you uh, have a, a business, right? Con- uh, apartment complex, warehouse floors, factory floors, 
you know, you don't want it to look bad. You don't want it to be a trip hazard for folks uh, that walk by. How about roads, streets, highways, bridges, approach, curb and gutters, right? All those situations are out there. Uh, and instead of replacing the concrete, which costs a lot of money, you can do it for a fraction of the cost by connecting there with our friends that Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support. Remember to not replace it, just lift it. They're locally Aggie owned and operated, and they're going to provide an easy, clean service at half the price of replacement. They are problem solvers when it comes to most concrete issues. Uh, they basically take a few hours to raise your concrete to get it up and running and looking the way it needs to be. So when you get home from work that day, they're there for two or three hours, let's say. You drive, drive into your driveway, perfect. It's like it, you, you left and, wow, your concrete looks great again. The number again, 979-933-8527. They do local. They do statewide. They do nationwide. They'll provide an honest opinion on all of your uh, areas that need to have work done. It is a great place to call when you have these issues out there. Complimentary Power Wash is part of the service after they finish the job. What you want to do is call them up or uh, visit them online. You can call them up at 979-933-8527 or follow Ascend Lift on Facebook or on Instagram. Again, don't replace it. Lift it with Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support. All right, we should have Trisha Ford here on the show in about a minute. It is Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. In the Rollo Insurance Studio, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center, Matthew Dawson. 
Um, one thing we didn't talk about was the half court shot. Um, what was a thousand dollars for a, an Aggie uh, student? That was awesome. I mean, buried. I mean, it was bank, right? She probably didn't call bank, you know, and she should probably only get half of what she got because she didn't call bank. But that was unbelievable. A thousand dollars on the line. I mean, there's a lot of pressure there in that shot. And I, by the way, like all the other games, people missed horrendously. Like it, the people weren't even close, and she just walked up and just buried it. It was yeah. awesome. And then Buzz afterwards was asked during the uh, presser about um, what do you call it? He was asked about matching it, or he he said he would match it. Correct. Yes, I believe. And then our own Luke Evangelos, I think, uh, got the girl's name. I believe her name is Liz. And I think he forwarded the information to Buzz. So I believe that that is going to happen. Thanks to our very own Luke Evangelist. All right, let's get ready for some softball. Trisha Ford is in studio. Hello. Howdy, how are you? All right, how are you? Good. Long time no talk. It's been a minute. You yeah, ready? I am. I'm excited. Yeah. 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 Well, let's talk a little bit about it. How different does year two feel for you considering like, You've established your culture. You know most of your players. You got new players, obviously, have joined the the program, but they there's been a, a way of life that has, has been established. Yeah, I think um, year two absolutely. Uh, you're more comfortable in your skin. You kind of know how things run, how things um, go, and and what to expect. But I also think it's harder. I think year one, it's the honeymoon. Everybody's excited. They got something new. Let's you know. And then year two, it's like, oh, this is reality. Yes. Yeah. Practice is going to be hard. Practice, you know, um, we're going to push you. We're going to push you past your comfort. So um, it, they've responded really well, and I'm excited for the year. But uh, I, I do think year two is a little harder um, in that, you know, retrospect. So last year was so much fun for, for your team. Now there's expectations that I'm sure you put on yourself. Fans have put. What is different about this year's team? Is there, is, I know you have some new players, but just overall, what feels different? Uh, I just think we're more athletic. Um, we have more of what I would say a typical um, program my mind has, a little more edge, a little more sass, um, a little more fight. Some of those things that I think are really important, especially in our sport, in the bat and ball sports, they're long, right? Long mm -hmm. seasons, seven innings, um, extra innings, those, you know, three-game series. So I think we're starting to see more of that, which is, you know, I enjoy that. I enjoy um, people not feeling comfortable with any type of lead with us, no matter what stage of the game it is. Tell us a little bit about Jasmine Hill. <laughs> can we call her Jazz? Is yeah, that, you okay. can call her Jazz, yes. <laughs> um, she's just, um, she's wonderful. Uh, she's super dynamic, uh, will play center field for us, bat in the middle of the lineup, brings some pop, you know, has decent speed, but just brings um, the it factor to the field, um, competitiveness, she knows what it looks like to play at a high level. Um, she she brings, you know, she won a Pac-12 championship. Um, so she's definitely, I think, at the beginning ruffled some feathers because she talks a little smack at practice. And then everybody got to, you know, they got used to her. of Like, oh, okay, that's just jazz being jazz. So she's just a fun kid to be around. And, and I'm, I'm excited that we get to have her for a year. Well, I, I read the press release, I think, Friday of last week, a and standouts Julia Cottrell and Jasmine Hill have been named to the Softball America Top 100 player list. Uh, that is cool to have a few of your players represented there. It's a it's a huge honor, and they both deserve it. Um, the one that I, um, I'm putting a chip on her shoulder is Coco Woolley, because if you watch any of our games, that kid's one of the most dynamic and athletic kids um, that I've ever coached. And so I said, hey, Coco, here's your chance. Like... Let's show them what you, who you really are. So Jules and, and Jazz, and we have Kennedy Powell. Mm -hmm. We call her KP, um, along with you know some solid pitching. Um, I think it's a, it's going to be a good it's going to be a good year. What yeah. does Julia Jules yeah. mean, mean to the program? <laughs> well, I just think um, she's had a lot of growth, and she would be the first to tell you that. But she's another one that has had you know a couple of stops here and there, but has always been a part of very successful programs, and she grew up you know, um, playing with USA softball was the youngest one to ever play, um, in, in, on our junior team. And so she's just somebody that brings a lot of experience, um, that competitiveness, um, I don't know, just the mental side of things of figuring out how to get it done no matter what. And so when you continue to put more and more of those pieces together, so a KP, a Jazz Hill, um, a Julia Cottrell, I think that, you know, it just starts to infiltrate into other parts, people in your in your program. And so you want that to help your freshmen get better and your sophomore get better. And, and so it helps elevate your program. Obviously, you want every area to be better. But did you focus on a couple areas like, hey, this is what cost us a few games last year. We need to be better at X, Y and Z. 
Yeah, um, yes. I think overall athleticism was our biggest um, kind of focus. I think we are way more athletic than we were last year on paper. And then outfield for me was something that we hit pretty hard. We, we And then we got depth. I think that's, you know, um, kind of the final piece that we really concentrate. We're always going to chase pitching. That's the name of the game. Um, so we got Brooke Vestal, which was huge. But for us, it was athleticism, outfield, and then uh, last but not le- uh, least, like real depth, not just bodies, but and we have you know players pushing each other. Our lineup is not going to stay the same for the whole year, and um, we're going to see who kind of rises to the top. How hard is that? And it's also a good thing, by the way. I don't think it's a bad <laughs> thing. But for players to understand, like it may not be your turn yet, but you're here because we believe in you, and it's going to be your turn. And that competition, how it raises everybody's game. Yeah, I think it's really hard in this day and age, and I think every coach will tell you that because of the transfer portal. But, um, you know, you, you are who you are, and I think, you know, for me, it's having those honest conversations. I think you have to establish as a coach a good relationship with your players and, and talk them through it and not be afraid to have those conversations and say, hey, this is where I think you are. Uh, you're going to get your opportunities. Sometimes it's as simple as it's a matchup, right? Mm-hmm. Like you do well against a down ball pitcher or a left-handed pitcher, vice versa, you know, and put in your time. And I always use a story. I had a kid at Fresno State, my first um, head coaching run a while back, and she was a pinch hitter only her first year. And she just, you know, and she wasn't happy with it. And I told her, I'm like, I'm okay that you're not happy with this. And then she became an All-American, like, at the end of her career. Her name is Morgan Howe. And so she was somebody that, you know, like – stayed the course, had the parents to stay the course. I think that's the other piece of it. And I'm sure there was many of times where she was frustrated, but what are you going to do with that frustration? Right. We got about 30 seconds left. Valpo, Lehigh, Lehigh, excuse me, twice, and then Tulsa. Just a a good group here. Yeah, it's a a good weekend. Um, Valpo, um, they have a lot of new players. Uh, Lehigh is a 41 season uh, last year. Uh, They are regulars in the postseason. Same with Tulsa. So um, just a lot of experience coming out. And for us, it's concentrate on our things, right? Can we control, um, you know, the free bases, the free base game, we call it, and then being able to get the big hit when you need to get the big hit. Awesome. Well, happy to have you here coming on the show often. Thank you very much for coming by. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you, Trisha Ford. Go check them out this weekend. It'll be fun. We'll hit a break. Buzz Williams joining us next here on Texags Radio.
Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Saturday, I had to watch the game from my parents' house. As you know, I've been taking care of them. Um, getting out of the hospitals this past uh, Friday, they both got out. It's been great. And got to watch a very thrilling game with them and my brother. And uh, what a win at the end. Let's go straight to the Brian Foley Law Hotline. We're joined by Buzz Williams here on Texas Radio. Buzz, good morning, sir. How are you? Doing good. How you doing? Doing wonderful, sir. So let's talk a little bit about that performance and just the how proud you are of those guys, how they grinded through a, a very tough game where Boots kind of went back to himself and you guys attacked the rim a lot, played great defense. Yeah, I thought we did some good things. Um, I think it's, you know, whether you play at Arkansas and lose at the buzzer or last Saturday against Ole Miss, uh, there's always going to be narratives that can be created from it all, but I think the, the league's really improved, and the margin is – I don't know that there is one. And um, so many things transpired. Um, Boots was great. Um, four had three fouls in the first half for the first time in his career. We had zero timeouts left with uh, eight minutes – over eight minutes to go in the game. So there's a lot of stuff, but I do think that sometimes just like in life, I think the intangibles uh, matter and somehow we have to continue to make sure that the intangibles that are important to those in our program uh, become a category. And uh, I I thought we failed last Saturday uh, in some regards, but it was very similar um, and what took place this Saturday. So we're thankful for the result. <clears throat> Sorry, Buzz. Buzz, I was uh, I was thinking about this team the other day, and at, at the end of that game, when you have Wade uh, on the inbound or on the inbounds there with 19 seconds left or whatever, and you watch college basketball enough, you see so many times that a mistake like that, a lot of times it, it's, it is the difference in, in winning and losing, and, and it's really hard for teams to recover from that kind of you know, mental mistake late. But for a program and a guy like Wade, a player like Wade, and a program that was built on defense, um, is that what got you guys through? I just feel like that being a defensive possession – was why you were able to overcome any any kind of uh, mistake that for a lot of other teams I think would have been costly or would have been deadly. And also the fact that you guys in the last few games have been in these literal final possession ball games, it feels like. I think like four of the last five, if I'm not mistaken. Buzz Williams? We don't have him right there. We'll put him on hold if the folks at Brian Broadcasting can uh, I just check on him. You can click click it up while we – but to go back to your point there, Billy, this team has on multiple occasions. Um, I think it was going into this game, they've had eight games this year, so now nine, yeah. where it came down to um, six points or less. I just love the way – like so there was that, that play on the inbound, and then I saw nobody – including Wade or anybody else, hang their head. They came back. And, and normally, you, even as a fan or someone watching, you're like, oh, man, here it comes. And you just didn't have that feeling because they don't present that. Wade certainly didn't. The rest of his team didn't. It was just like, yeah, okay, we, got, we just got to stop. Now we got to get another one. Right. And to me, because they were on defense, I just was like, they're going to figure out a way. Like, it. I thought the only way they were going to lose that game is if Florida just hit some crazy shot. Like, I didn't think they weren't – I thought they were going to play good enough defense to win it there on that final possession because when it's crunch time, it's typically what they do. You even look back against Ole Miss and that shot that was made was just a, a deep, deep, deep three. Um, it just felt like they knew they were going to get that stop there. There didn't seem to be any panic. There didn't seem to be any uh, – you know, no one was hanging their head and they went out and did it. Yeah, How they, many shots did the Gators miss on that two? They forced a couple misses and then got the ball? Well, we got Buzz back, so okay. um, you may have to reset your question, Billy. Yeah, uh, Buzz, thanks. I was just saying, when when you have a situation like that inbounds play there at the end, it, it just I didn't see a single player, Wade or anyone else, 
hang their head. You guys went to, you know, you talked about, and then go out there and get the stop. Like, there was just no moment. I think most of the people in attendance, too, were just kind of a, oh, no, but then very quickly said, okay, we're on defense. We can do this because it's A&M basketball. That's what it felt like there. Talk about just recovering there and, and getting that stop and then your players realizing, oh, well, we got to go out and do it all again because, again, like I said, they didn't seem phased by that at all whatsoever. And so many times when you watch college basketball or a- any level, that type of turnover there can prove so costly. Yeah, I thought the I thought the defensive possession um, prior to that was really good. Yeah, um, our, our guys <clears throat> did a lot of good things. Uh, we were had the ball back, and I I don't think that Forrest probably ever had three fouls in any game in the first half in his life, and he's for sure never done that at any point in his life. Mm-hmm. And um, when they were when they called timeout, I asked for if he wanted to stay in the game, and he said, of course. <laughs> um, and then I just drew up what I anticipated that they were going to run, and we talked about what we needed to do and how we were going to handle the ball screen coverage if there is one and how important it would be to finish the possession with the stop. You don't know when they're going to shoot. There's 19.9, they're down one, and so – uh, they're not waiting to shoot until the end of the clock. They're yeah. a very good rebounding team. And so we have to make sure that there's only one shot. And so we stay with the five guys that were in the game that had got to stop the previous possession. And we're, we're really excited and thankful for how it all turned out. Buzz, the last couple of Februarys, your team finds its stride. Um, I don't know if you can put your finger on it, but is there – a method to the madness, like why is it, and you know, you start February off with a great win, um, that your team seemed to start getting better as the year moves on? Yeah, I don't know. Um, a lot of it probably has to do with really good players, and we have a really good staff, and wherever we've lived, to be honest, I think that if you research uh, February, I think that probably holds true no matter where we've been, and so I, I do not want to take any credit for that, but I do want to give credit to those that are in the group that made all of that stuff happen. Buzz, coming off three straight home games and and now going back on the road, playing a team you've already played once, uh, what's the what's the me- what was the message coming back today, or what's the message going to be? Come- well, I'm sorry, it's 10 a.m. You've already been back. What was what's the message? <laughs> Uh, is it just business as well, usual, or is it a little bit different when you have such an extended homestand? Yeah, I, um, the three at home obviously were great, um, but that the first time the SEC has ever taken a bye was included yeah. in that three game stretch is probably helpful too. Um, on a mirror opponent, particularly the second time. I don't know if we do it right, to be honest, but we start the process of studying them with our game. Mm -hmm. And then we study the games since our game. And, you know, um, sometimes, sometimes there's two or three games in between. Uh, Sometimes there's five or six games in between. And so, uh, Missouri has played three games since we played them in College Station. So uh, we we study all of the prep work that we did leading up to the game. Mm-hmm. And then we study the game that we played. And then we kind of base our decisions from that based on what they've done since. And so uh, I think so far uh, this will, other than LSU, uh, this will be our second time playing a mirror opponent for the second time. And so um, obviously there's going to be several of those as we come down the stretch. Uh, We haven't even played all of our mirror opponents once yet. And so sometimes the timing of all of that makes it funny, but um, that's kind of how we go about doing a mirror uh, prep. I don't know if that's the right way or the wrong way. It's just kind of how we've always done it, whether we were, in an imbalanced league or playing mirror opponents 
that's that's the way we've always done it. Buzz, a lot of times, I, th- I feel like players in, in any sport, but especially for whatever reason, it seems like basketball. You- Football, it seems like you can see it coming more in practice maybe than you do games, and then you, you kind of hear whispers and then this guy's really coming on. Basketball, it seems like I'll hear you mention a name here and there. They had a good game, you know, but they're not really doing it necessarily on the stat sheet or in this wow fashion. But usually when that happens and we kind of hear you saying, you know, this player I thought had a really good – it seems like that precedes mm-hmm. – them having a, a big game or two or hitting a nice run of basketball, it, who would be that guy right now that you're feeling good about how they're playing, maybe better than just to the naked eye, and you're like, okay, if he can keep this going, uh, there's some some good ball ahead for him? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, today, uh, I would say that's Mo. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he was tremendous on Saturday. Uh, and to your question, uh, I can't relate it to football because I'm not, I, I don't know, but I do think that there is some translation in regards to how you practice is how you play. And I admire him so much. He's, um, he's resisted all of the voices uh, that have surrounded him in certain scenarios. He's been incredibly loyal to, to us. Mm-hmm. And I'm very grateful for that. And he's ultra talented. And I think you could tell by the reaction of his teammates in the minutes that he played on Saturday. And I told him uh, when it happened, and uh, we were texting back and forth yesterday, I would have played him even more. We were just in the single bonus slash double bonus, some of which was because he had created it because he gets fouled at a high rate. Actually, he gets fouled at a rate higher than anybody on our team. Really? The problem was is he went 0-4 from the free throw line. And I was like, no, you're getting fouled, and we appreciate that, and we need that, but we can't go 0-4 uh, <laughs> because this is going to be a one-possession game. And so mm-hmm. uh, if we can if we can keep Mo going in that same direction over the next four weeks, I think that I'm encouraged by that. I thought he had a huge defensive rebound. I thought he was really locked in, guarding the ball one-on-one in the way that we want to. And so if we could uh, have someone other than those that we know already, if we could have someone maybe who hasn't been prominent in the last five weeks become prominent in the next four weeks, I think that changes, changes our team a little bit. Buzz Williams here on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. I I do want to talk to you about boots because there was a stat that came out. um, It's been out for a couple seasons now, but you're ten and one when he scores twenty or more, and I guess the pressure of that, um, how he seems to embrace it, especially in these big games against Kentucky, against Florida, we see this kind of performance from him when it really needs to happen. Yeah, he's similar to what I was saying to Tex Ags and the media and everybody the last few days. I I love Boots. Uh, I admire him. Uh, he's not perfect. I'm not perfect. Uh, I need to be a better coach. He needs to be a better player. Um, and we do have faults. All of us do uh, within our program. And um, I'm happy that he played well. And the stats that you're mentioning, I'm sure that that's the truth. Um, but I think all of that will play itself out. And uh, maybe a lot of the things that were said, maybe some people can apologize for to him face-to-face. Um, I love him. I love his mom. I love his dad. I love his stepmom. And uh, we're really appreciative of who they are to us within our program and really thankful for how he played on Saturday um, amidst all that was said pregame and postgame. And uh, glad that he played well. Buzz, to me, it it's always – the athletes can screw up, you know, to 8 million different degrees. And, and I think over time a coach shows whether they discipline uh, their athletes and within their program properly or not. I think you guys over there at basketball have proven as much over a five-year span. Um, I know you can't say a lot, 
you said a lot this weekend, and I think anybody that didn't uh, piece that together is just not paying attention. Well, I think I think um, it's like anything, right? Um, if somebody wants to know how much money I make, uh, you can request that yep. through the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, I think there's some documentation out there yep. that would say exactly what it is. And so I, I'm going to be uh, guarded, mm -hmm. Billy, in what I say. Uh, I've been caught off guard to be transparent with how this has played out. And so... Uh, I'm going to be guarded in what I say, and I'm also uh, going to be protective of those in our group, regardless of who's saying what to me uh, and what is being said. That's kind of the nature of the exposure of the job, uh, and even for our players, that that's part of the exposure. And mm -hmm. so uh, we're not trying to be holier than now uh, in any respect. Uh, we make a lot of mistakes. We need to shoot the ball better. We need to make free throws more. Um, we're, we're only four and four. And so we've got a lot of work to do. But um, I, I do think that we have good human beings on our staff and within our program that play for us. But they do make mistakes. And uh, Boots has made a bunch of them. And I've made more than Boots. Mm -hmm. But on, on this deal... Uh, I'm going to try to handle it the right way. Yeah. Yep. Buzz, uh, on a light note, let's uh, talk about the half-court shot, the young lady who hit the half-court shot, $1,000. Then afterwards, yeah. you, you tell the world you're going to match it. Just uh, what a cool vibe, and especially on a, on a very nice night or afternoon, I should say, at Reed Arena. Yeah, and so I, uh, until, until uh, post-game media, I didn't even – I knew something had happened because I – during the timeout, our guys were kind of uh, distracted, not negatively, but they knew something was going on. And then uh, somebody mentioned it uh, in post game, and I didn't, I, uh, even at that moment in time, I didn't know what happened. And so uh, yesterday after church, I, I quit looking at social media a month or so ago, and my, my youngest daughter said, Dad, uh, did you see her hit the shot? And I was like, no, I haven't seen it. And so she showed it to me. And I was like, oh, that is awesome. And so baby said to me, um, has she called the office? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I forgot I said that. So I texted uh, Landry and Luke, and I said, hey, uh, I apologize. I didn't tell you guys last night, but somebody hit a shot. And I said in post postgame uh, that I would match it. So I want to be a person of my word. If for some reason the young lady reaches out to the office, which is what I told her to do, uh, get her information so I can get her the $1,000. And this was yesterday at like uh, at noon, maybe. So I'm texting Landry and Luke uh, on a mass text. And they, they both text back, uh, Coach, she reached out last night. We have her information. And so I said, okay, so uh, – her, her name is Liz. Maybe I sh shouldn't say that, but I, I wrote a check to Liz this morning. And so we, we doubled down and good for her. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that she hit it in overalls, number one. Number two, you were here way back in the day. I, there was a point in time where hitting a half-court shot around here might have gotten you like one of those giant Hershey bars or like a Chicken Express <laughs> tender box. So they have... <laughs> <laughs> they have come a long way. I used to go nuts when yeah. I'd be like, you're make, giving them like a free meal for it and a half court. It should be like a car. I know. That's what I, that, I yeah, yes, sir. I do remember that from yesteryear. <laughs> but uh, as you mentioned, when I said that, when they were asking me about it to try to, um, <clears throat> to, to make me aware, I guess, I think they must have thought that I already knew. And I said, well, what did she win? And, <laughs> I said a thousand dollars. I'm like a thousand dollars. She had a half court shot, and we're giving her a thousand dollars at Texas A&M. So, yeah, I was caught off guard in real time when they said the the prize was a thousand dollars. And then when I when Baby showed it to me uh, on the video, I was like, I think she used to play because she stepped up there and knew like this is how this is this is what I have to do if I'm going to have a chance to make it. So yeah. good for her. Good for her. Yep. 
Yeah, we should give her tuition for the year or something. I, I, some places they do tuition, or maybe that's college game day, but, I mean, come on. Let's, let's yeah. step it up. That's yeah. Right. yeah, maybe it's just college game day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's just college game day. Well, well, now she has enough money to buy her books for the semester. True, true. She's a student. They don't do books anymore, though. I don't even know what you do now. <laughs> yeah, it's online. Anymore. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. Buzz, we appreciate it. <laughs> Best of luck this week. We'll be watching. Okay, have a good day. Thanks, Buzz. See you, Buzz. Thank you. All right, we'll hit a break here. Billy with us for the rest of the hour. Right now we're talking Costa Vida. Love me some Costa Vida. If you go to Reed Arena, you want to get your grub on. When you go to Costa Vida, you go and do it. You should go today, um, especially for men's and women's basketball game. They're right inside that main entrance. So when you get in there, you know, you, maybe you go to your seat first, but I think you get your food first, right? You get your food, you sit down, you just in one-stop shop. You go there, main entrance across sections 113 and 112. And they got a great menu there. Chili lime chicken. They got sweet pork burritos. They got chili lime chicken and sweet pork quesadillas and chips and queso. So go there when you go to Reed Arena. But hey, if you're listening to this show, you either come to the uh, Bryan College Station area often or you live in the Bryan College Station area. And when you're around town, you got to go to South College Station, SoCo as they call it, and get yourself some Costa Vida there. Great food, great people, and uh, just an awesome atmosphere when you go there. Fresh Mex done exactly the way you want it because every ingredient matters when you go there. You choose your entree, you choose your protein, and bam, you got yourself a signature dish there at Costa Vida. They got specialty drinks, they've got great desserts, and also they have breakfast. You go there in the morning, get your breakfast taco on. It is in South College Station. You should check them out. 4501 Mills Park Circle in College Station. It's Costa Vida. Say hi to Holly for us.
So I haven't read it yet, and I'm sure I'll get into it with Billy. I'll read it. But uh, I'm reading a uh, tweet from Connor O'Gara. Connor Wigman won't start off as an all-SEC guy, but could finish there, question mark. He says, absolutely. Why I'm high on the forgotten A&M quarterback entering year three. That is something I do want to talk to Billy about here in a moment because we've been saying it on this show, like all these, not that rankings and ratings and all that stuff really matter when it comes to right now. Uh, but one thing I'll say about Connor O'Gara, um, he, he tells you how, what he thinks and he usually backs it up. You don't have to agree with him, but he's got some good thinking behind it. I'm, I'm interested in reading that and I'll, I'll get O'Gara on the program here this week. Billy, I'm just going to read you the tweet and uh, we're going to try to get Connor O'Gara on the show here this week. But he goes, Connor Wegman won't start as an all-SEC guy, but could finish there. Absolutely. Why I'm high on the forgotten A&M quarterback entering year three. And he is forgotten. Uh, yeah. Not here, though. No, no, no. That's what – and Connor and I talked about that. I was on his, his podcast the other day, and I mentioned that. Like, everybody forgets that when – going into that Auburn game – I can always bring up this story because everyone was here. It was SEC Nation, and everyone was talking about Connor. And the Jordan and, it, and it was before it was before Jaden Daniels just skyrocketed right. in route to the Heisman. But he was already playing really good ball. But it wasn't like okay, this guy's going to win the Heisman. We were talking about like it was like game four. It was game one, game two, game two. It was, yeah, it was probably game four, and. Uh, People were the, that crew, Tebow, Jordan Rogers, Roman Harper, and everybody's just going, man, kid's really good. And, and there's the quarterbacks are saying he does things that, you know, the release point, the how quick he's getting rid of the football, the accuracy, the, the different platforms he's thrown from, the feel of the pressure, all these things are impressing. The QBs, the guys that actually played it, the DBs, the ones that play against elite quarterbacks, and they're going, it's, it's Jaden Daniels and, and in who. It's like Connor or Jackson Dart at that time. Yeah. We know what Jackson Dart ended up doing last year. We know, obviously, what Jaden ended up doing and a couple other quarterbacks along the way. Baker up, you know, up at, uh, I say Baker, up at Missouri, uh, Cook. But Baker's the guy that left Freddie Cook. LSU. Yeah. So, you saw the season Cook had there. And you, there are other – Rattler had his ups and downs. But at that point in time, before Connor got hurt, and it, his season should have only gone up from there, the more football he played. And you look at the number of games he's played in and some of the games he's had. You look at that Ole Miss game, his first start. You look at LSU, even, even Miami in defeat. Was it Connor? I think Connor said it on the show. His TD to inter interception ratio is like, I don't, I don't know exactly, but it was like 17 to 2. Right. And the two interceptions came against Miami. One was a, a drop from Anias where the ball went up in the air. And was, was the last the offensive spot. play? And the other one was just fourth down. They blitz. You just got to throw it up for grabs. And, you know, and yeah. that's it. So, yeah, I think people are going to sleep on Wigman this year. And I think Connor has a lot to prove. I mean, I think we all believe in it, yep. what we've seen and we know, but to the outside and to the league, he's got first of all, he's got to prove he can stay healthy. It's never easy for any quarterback in this league. Just look around it. It's a war of attrition. Number two, you know, he's just got to prove it long term. And I believe he will. And I think he's in a much better position to do so under this staff than he was previously. Just because I think there towards the end of Jimbo, you're just, you know, you, you're, you're going from, you know, Jimbo's offense to this mishmash of Jimbo and what he'll allow Petrino to do, and that mi makes a match. Petrino was a new voice last year. It was just too – the offensive line was just in, in a staggering decline the last two seasons. I think you'll get a lot better there just off coaching and scheme, and I think – putting it as simply as I can, asking them to do less. Yeah. You know, just being just a little luck. more basic football. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think he's set up to succeed more so now than, than he ever has been. And that injury, that injury a lot of times will, will get, get a young player's attention to kind of say, all right, man, I cannot wait to get out there. And I'm going to be so much better when I do get out there than I was because this not playing thing sucked. And I get that vibe from Connor when he comes in and stuff. So I, I think 
if there's a quarterback with upward trajectory in this league this year and you're ranking like who can make the biggest move, Connor Wigman's got to be first on that list. All right, we'll hit a break. Do want to talk about uh, the late signing day here on Wednesday, and uh, we'll get back yeah. into some basketball stuff and then the uh, SEC Big Ten Alliance. Right now we're talking Caldwell Country Chevrolet. They're on Highway 21. They're on Caldwell. They're online at caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. Start your search online there. Go to the website. You'll see the vehicles that they have. And when you're ready to make that trip out to uh, Caldwell, it's not a far drive. We'll get into that in a moment. But you'll go there. You'll see the selection. You'll be able to test drive the vehicles. You'll get the best customer service. They'll talk to you about your trade-in value, and you're going to be happy with that. That I can guarantee. And uh, you're just going to love the entire experience. Because when you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet, you know you're getting great customer service, a great price, and just a great atmosphere. And that's why they have so much repeat business. That's why Billy, myself, R.C. Slocum, Dante Hall have all bought their vehicles at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. It is the place to go in this area. And if you're you know, listening anywhere here in Texas, come by and check it out. I always talk about it. It's not that far of a drive. The very edge of Brian to the beginnings of Caldwell. We're talking 15 minutes. Short conversation away. But you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the good people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. They're located on Highway 21 in Caldwell and online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. And we are back here on Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Billy with us here for the last half hour. He will be back on Wednesday. We're going to do a National Signing Day show. Billy will join us for the last two hours of the show. And I think uh, we just uh, confirmed Ryan Broninger will be with us for the last two hours of the show. Feeling good, buddy, about uh, not only the class overall, but what Wednesday could feel like? 
Yeah, I'm going to bite my tongue right now because I'm going to, but if you're listening and, and you're, uh, you know, anyone that listens to what we say on here, and it's for fun, and take, if you go and take that to a coach or an athlete or anything and directly give that to them on off of our show because uh, whatever you disagree or you think someone across the street will disagree, Call me first, and I'll tell you to kiss my ass personally. And then I'll tell you not to listen and to unsubscribe. And so if you're listening to me, you know who you are. Stop listening. Come up to me and tell me you're the one that did that. At least shake my hand and say, hey, I did that. Uh, and I'll stop listening, and you can cancel my subscription because I don't, I don't play that crap. I don't do that. Um, and I think anyone that does is a loser. So I don't care who you are. Continue. Hey, buddy. Uh, That's okay. I just, that, nothing pisses me off more than cowardly crap like that. Yeah. Nothing pisses me off, especially for all we do, uh, you know, to try to be a positive voice around here and all the crap we get for being positive. Uh, you do some stuff like that, you're slime in my eyes. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you give them $1 or $50 million. I don't give a damn. You go do that, you and I have a problem. Come talk to me and tell me you did it. Wednesday could be a very good day for Texas A&M. Uh -huh. um, we'll be doing that the signing day show. Um, there's positive reviews right now on Terry Bussey, potentially Ashton Bethel Roman. Um, it's, it's it's trending in a good direction. They got to finish it out. Yeah, I think you know LSU's got a lot of confidence over there on Terry Bussey. We're feeling like there's still plenty of confidence on the A&M side. So typically, when that happens, you know we'll not typically, 100% of the time, one side's going to be bitterly disappointed. Yep. Um, but I, I felt good about a and M side of that for a while. LSU's got, they've got a lot of momentum, and they're pushing this angle of they flipped all these guys from a and M to LSU. Um, more power to them. I don't think those guys are bad players. I, I personally, if there's... If there's one that that one stings the most to me, it's Relaford. I think he's a ball player. Mm -hmm. But multiple of those kids were Louisiana kids, okay? Uh, Weston Davis, Cohen Eccles, again, that was – that's in a transition period between coaches. A&M had a terrible two seasons. LSU won the West and won a Heisman. It, it, you know, they've got to even the scales, and that's why you make a coaching change. And I think Mike Elko and this staff – are going to even the scales. And you hope that these Texas kids that cross the Sabine River ultimately regret it. They ultimately regret not going to A&M. They ultimately regret not going to Texas. Mm -hmm. And getting a degree in this state and, and being an Aggie or a Longhorn and being able to proudly walk around this state, it's the same thing LSU does with Louisiana kids. You know, it's their, sa it's their same pitch to Louisiana kids that want to leave. And that's how they, you know, were able to get guys – like, you know, like Relaford, like uh, Dominic back, you know, they go and get a five-star and a four-star D lineman back. That's, that's the push is like play for your home state, represent the boot, yada, yada. And, and, and it's, a, it's a fair sentiment. Do I think they get those guys that ain't not had the season they had? No. I think, I think they were excited and, and committed to being Aggies, particularly playing for Elijah Robinson. When that changed, you had weeks of bad football. Then you went and lost in Baton Rouge. You know, so it, I understand why A&M's losing those head-to-heads to, to Bayou Bengals this year. That has to change. That's, again, that's why you made a head coaching change because the on-field results weren't going to support you being able to go into enemy territory and get good players. Um, but as far as, as far as Bussy goes, I think he's getting pulled – by a lot of guys in Baton Rouge and a lot of guys in College Station. Uh, but I just think when, when the ink dries, ink, we call it now, I don't know if they, when the ink dries on Wednesday, I still think he ends up in Aggie, but I'm not, I'm not like over the moon confident on it. I think it could go either way, but I, I think I like where A&M has been with that one from the time of his commitment moving forward. You see LSU staffers right now on Twitter retweeting and liking and posting uh, Harold Perkins in an A&M uniform, and then Harold Perkins flipping you know, the, his tweets from, right. from those time periods. So 
they're feeling real confident over there. It's interesting, but he also had just come off that visit, and then he came to A&M on that visit. So, again, coming out of the visit this weekend, I wasn't getting any vibes that, like, and we'll get this a lot. The vibes weren't coming in that, that he was slipping away from A&M. And if he was, at this point anyway, the, the panic and the, oh, crap, we got to make up ground, we got to have a last 48-hour rally right. would, would already be starting. And I haven't, I haven't gotten much of that yet. I do think it's a fight still, though. I do not, I'm not going to sit here and say they're getting him. I'm saying if you made me pick today, I would still, I would still lean towards him being an Aggie. It's obviously a very big one. It's a very big one. It, it's, he's a sensational athlete. He's a great kid. He can start very early at corner or wide receiver. Right. He's that good in the return game. I mean, he's a special talent, and he's, he's a Texas kid that, you know, again, LSU went and flipped, I think, two really impactful, really good defensive linemen, but they flipped them they're Louisiana players that were going to come over to Texas. Right. So it's, it, makes it, it makes keeping this one that much more important. And if you can do it, it'll be a little bit of a payback for Harold Perkins, actually. Just a little bit, yeah. The same thing. I mean, a little different because they're still trying to flip him from you. So it's a little different. But, I mean, it's just a massive late head-to-head battle. with, a, with I, I, I'm going to do this for a while say it wrong, a division rival, but you know what I mean. It's a conference rival, and it is a heated recruiting rival. Yeah. Um, Ashton Bethel Roman, too, trending in the right direction as well. Yeah, feel good about that one. You know, Bronny's done a great job of covering that, going back to the first signing period when uh, A&M almost was able to get the flip. They brought him in for a visit late. He was one of the very early guys in the 24 class targeted by this new staff that wasn't really targeted by the previous staff. So you, you can tell they really uh, like what he brings to the table. I like Holman Wiggins and his chances of uh, he and Colin Klein getting him ultimately in Aguilar. And another, it's, it's Arkansas, so it hits a little differently. But it's a head-to-head, and it's a head-to-head o- over a conference foe, but it's also for a real position of need at wide receiver. It's a, it's a real position of need. Most of your damage this year has been done uh, and most of it's been done in the portal. Right. Uh, so from in the freshman ranks, you want to see them really go out and get a guy like him that brings a great deal of speed. He brings NFL lineage, and he's a playmaker. So and, and a Houston area kid at that. And when you look at this 25 class in state, you want A&M to get back into just kind of owning and dominating the Houston area. Um, you got to start it. St- got to start it somewhere. And I think a, a late ad from Houston can kind of get you going for next season. You get those two. You get Robert Borden on Wednesday, and then you back it up with a really good season. Mm -hmm. Now you're back to trending in that direction that we thought A&M was going early on. I think with Mike Elko, the staff he's put together, the recruiting team he's got over there, which organization, day-to-day grinding at it, and then also like a a master plan, like a big-picture plan, those three things. Plus, Elko and this, this, I think, what's a really, really strong staff as recruiters as well. That staff, the fresh start under Elko, the recruiting team they've got over there and just kind of leaving no stone unturned, complete and total, day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month attention to detail, improved visit experiences, thinking outside the box for the, you know, to make things a little different, a little more fun, a little more... Uh, interactive, whatever. That combo right there, I think, will lead to. And, and plus, oh by the way, this thing called NIL, and it's not about recruiting kids off of it. It's about them understanding Texas A and M. You know, if I go to A and M, there's a tremendous NIL structure there. Mm-hmm. The NIL machine for A and M, I think, is is just firing up. By the way, speaking of NIL, did you see what happened in Missouri today? Uh, donor gave, I think, I want to say $62 million, 50 of it for stadium renovations, and then 12 of it for uh, NIL. 12 of it for NIL. I think that's really, I mean, that, that's a game changer for Mizzou. Heck yeah. Drinkwitz, and you know, I had some people this morning text me, well, that's what happens when you win. I'm like, oh, yeah, it is true, but let's, let's not act like 
Here's my thing. That's not a negative if you're A&M. It's not a, see, that's a bull. That's what. No, like, that's why you hired a new coach, is to take another swing at winning and yep. winning big. All Missouri showing you that if you have a 2012 season all over again, which, by the way, was a two-loss year without a, without a uh, trophy until the postseason. You, you had a Heisman. You had an Outlin. Those, those were great. But you didn't, you, know, you didn't win a division. You didn't win a conference. It was a two-loss season. And they did it again in 2020. You won New Year's Six Bowls, essentially, like Missouri did this year. Mizzou was what? Were they a two- or three-loss team this year? I think they were two. I think they lost to LSU and they lost to Georgia. That might have been it. But anyway, point being, you know, it wasn't a championship right. season for them. If Missouri can get that kind of uh, excitement going and generated off of one good season, then Lord knows what A&M could do. And so instead of looking at it as a negative, like, well, it's because they're win Well, no, they're not winning. They won one year, and look what's happened yeah. because it's a hungry fan base. And, and I'm, I like what Drink's doing up there. I actually kind of root for him. I won't root for him when he brings his team to Kyle Field. And, and unfortunately, I think they're going to have two really good seasons, and they might parlay that yeah. because of the excitement and what's that, what that's resulting in in the form of NIL. And he does a great job in the portal. And I think you got a guy right here that just proved he'll do a great job in the portal. Just that one breakthrough season with a program like A&M can really extend itself out further, you know, several years if you do it right. So, you know, I think I look at Missouri, instead of looking at that as a negative, I look at it and go, okay, that's we, attainable. We can it's do that. attainable really quickly around here. And when you do, this thing could really take off. They need it, though. They need to quickly have a season to get everyone excited. I've heard a lot of people talking about it. Scott Van Pelt, I thought, had a great segment on it on his one big thing the other night. The willingness to participate in NIL will wane and wane quickly everywhere. Everywhere. I'm sure there are people at Alabama with all their national titles that are going – Man, is this even worth it anymore? When is enough enough? You lose Nick Saban. All these players are leaving. You know, like, yep. it, everywhere it can wane very quickly. Let Sark and Texas come in here with all this hype next year and, and let them go eight and four. Lose to Michigan, lose three conference games. See how, how any particular donor there that's kicking in 10 million is going to feel about doing another 10 million of his hard earned money that he could go invest any number of places or save for his family or anything. So, it is fleeting, but on the flip side, if you win big at this place, I think you're going to see people lining up, and, and you, can, you can ride that wave to a championship. You really can. All right, we'll hit a break. We'll come back with one final segment here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Time to end the day with Double Dave's. Call our number 12-979-693-1150. We'll hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or one large topping pizza from Double Dave's. They've been serving Aggieland since 1984. Double Dave's serving up your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls with reliable in-house delivery, pipe, uh, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click DoubleDave's.com and your favorites are on their way. As a reminder, they are not open on Mondays. Billy, you saw the most recent uh, news. I think it was Friday about the uh, SEC and Big Ten alliance, and they're going to figure out the future of college football. Not surprising. Um, I think the surprising part for me is it's taken this long the last three years for them just to finally be like, we'll figure it out. I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I just get so – I'm so burnt out about alliances. and What, happened, what was that big alliance going on between the – Big the Ten and the ACC. 12 and the ACC or whatever it yeah. was back then. Like, how'd that pan out? Like – all I know is, I, and I know Aggies are still, you know, they're always going to be upset about Texas coming in the SEC, and I, I didn't want them in there. Um, still don't. Actually, though, I'm okay with it now. You start playing them, and, you know, I, I do think what the last couple of years have brought to light when it comes to Texas and Oklahoma is get their asses in the league right. ASAP because they're fattening up by playing bad football teams, and, and they're recruiting to the SEC while – Padding their record and remaining relevant in the rankings and getting their TV games because they're ranked high and getting into the playoffs through an easier path. Like, get them in here. Uh, but people are going to be down on Sankey around here, I think, in, to some level, or a lot of people, you know, in perpetuity. I think Sankey's the best leader in college, fo- in college athletics. Yep. I think he's the best conference commissioner. I think if there was somebody to run college sports, he would be my pick, hands down, no brainer. I don't think on any level he hates or has it out for a and I, I just truly don't believe that. I, I've had plenty of conversations. You've, you've yeah. sat down and met with him you know, when he's come on the show and stuff. I've had conversations off air, social settings, whatever. I know people that know him. I know what goes on behind closed doors to, you know, to a very small level in that, in that conference. Yep. I think Sankey – would love nothing more than to see a and succeed athletically and in football. It means that much more. It's part of the reason they brought A&M in. You, you, you know, we always hear sleeping giant, you know, wake up. They could be a juggernaut. What conference doesn't want a, a, a sleeping giant to become an awakened giant? And I think that's the hope for the conference is that Texas and A&M are giants. And A&M join LSU and Alabama and Georgia. By the way, you know, if there's a couple departments and or programs that I think the league would love nothing more than to see become relevant across the board and especially in football, it's A&M in Florida. And with Florida, it would be again, right? right? Because they've been there and they've done that in every sport. But those are the two that I think if those two can ascend, man, it brings the league up and, and so much uh, in terms of what, the, what it can do on the football field and off. So Sankey out in front of that thing and the SEC and the Big Ten, it certainly hits differently than what we've seen before. And I think it's a real threat and the NCAA needs to wake up or they're going to be obsolete. Thank you, Billy. All right, dude. All right, that's going to do it for Tex Radio on a Monday. We'll see you manana.